Welcome, everybody, to Sidious Mag Live from the World Athletics Championships. It is day six. My brain is melting. Okay. Day six, uh, and the excitement levels are through the roof right now because I'm Chris Chavez, Kyle Merber's here, John Anderson's here, and we are joined by a very special guest that we've been waiting all week for. <laughs> it's, it seems ridiculous to even have to introduce <laughs> the, the greatest of all time. I feel like this is not a question here. There's no debate. 12 gold medals at these global championships. No silver, no bronze. You know, uh, former world record holder in both the 200 and the 400. Uh, you, know, you know him for his gold spikes, but I know him for the best Twitter in track and field. <laughs> yeah. Hands <laughs> down. If, if there was a commissioner for the sport, you've got our vote. <laughs> that, is, that is it. Michael Johnson, thank you so much thank for you, being Thank here. you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. Good to be here. How so, yeah. no interest in a set? Just give me all the gold ones. <laughs> um, silver medals and bronze medals are good medals. Yeah. They're, they're For some good people, medals. you know, yeah, they're really I mean, they're good. good medals. I just, you know, don't that's traffic, what, don't traffic in that right. area. Yeah. You the, know? the people that have those, that's what they tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, it's I, I'm. It is the thing that I'm most proud of. You know, I'm big on consistency. You know, consistency and and longevity, and it's. Yeah, it's the thing I'm most proud of, you know, that I was able to go to every championship and, yeah, and, and, and win. So, yeah. What's it like being at these uh, where you're in a different capacity, but, you know, you're working and at the same time, you know, the, the insights you bring, whether it's on the broadcast or on Twitter, you can tell that you are a fan as well. And just kind of really excited about uh, the athletes that we, we get to, to witness. Yeah, I mean, it's it's always exciting. I mean, look. This is my 21st. I'm showing my age for sure. Now, this is my 21st uh, world championship for BBC. So after I retired. So that's not including <laughs> the, the, the races when I was competing. Um, and no, I enjoy it. I, I've, I've always enjoyed it. I'm certainly, yeah, a fan of the sport. Um, I, look, I love this sport. I, I owe everything I have to track and fill. I, I mean, I've been able to do things that I couldn't have possibly imagined as a young kid growing up in Oak Cliff in Dallas, Texas, you know, and, um, and I owed all the track and field. So I love the sport. And um, yeah, I mean, this championships, I knew it, you know, before it started that, you know, everything that happened on the track was going to be amazing. And it hasn't, uh, it hasn't let us down at all. The competition, the races have been just uh, electric every night. You've obviously had a very successful career at home competing on the biggest stage. What is that like for the athletes now to have the, the U.S. support behind them? Yeah, it's I mean, it's it's significant, you know, and, and you're, you're really lucky um, as an athlete. Let's put that in perspective. The last time a major championship, <laughs> world championships or Olympics took place in America was 1996. I mean, there have been athletes. There have been two generations of athletes in between that time and now. They did not get a chance to compete here on home soil. It's an amazing experience to be able to, you know, sort of have everyone there. And I'll, I'll never forget when I was um, in Atlanta in 1996, the first round of the 400 meters, I walked out onto the stadium, and I typically am like, absolutely just 100% focused. I don't, I don't hear the crowd. I don't, I mean, I'm, focus was my thing. I broke focus. It was ridiculous. It was just the amount of noise and the screaming crowd. It was just, it was electric. And then that was round one of the 400. That happened every night thereafter. <laughs> Three more rounds of the 400, all four rounds of the 200. And it just gave you that energy. And of course, you know, for me also, uh, I mean, it's a difference between an Olympics and this is a world championship. But um, obviously, I had the opportunity to make history there, and I did, and it changed everything with my career. I do it changed to... everything. I was able to transcend the sport um, as a result of having done what I did on American soil. Had I done that anywhere else, four years prior in Barcelona or four years later in Sydney, it wouldn't have had the same effect. Did you, did you say four rounds of, was it both? <laughs> 
the 400 and the 200? Yeah, 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 youngster. <laughs> it was. <laughs> yeah, I did not. Yeah, I mean, Kyle, four yeah, rounds of the It was 400. four rounds of the 400, <laughs> then two and four rounds of the 400. It was four rounds, <laughs> yeah. See? I that's, that. that's what Mo Green was saying, too, right? And he ends up next to some guy from Sri Lanka who ran 11 2. <laughs> right? Like, at, at some point, you're like, this is unnecessary for me. You've had to go yeah. in there with, like, okay, I got to. I'm going to run 48 and still win by four seconds in that first round. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, you know, it, I like what they've done in the 100 where they have the preliminary round. So it gives people an opportunity, you know, to just sort of take part. And it's great. But, you know, you shouldn't have the other athletes going through that. So it's good that they've gotten down to three rounds. But this is ridiculous here. The schedule here is crazy. 400 meter schedule. No 400 meter runner wants to do that. You don't want I didn't. We had. At the Olympics that year, it was four rounds in a row, four days in a row, which I preferred. Mm. Like when I broke the world record in the 400 in 1999 at the World Championships, it was three days and a rest day, and then and nobody liked the rest day. Oh, really? Here they've got, they had the 400 meter first round, two days of rest, then they're going to have the semifinal, then another day of rest. So it's six days for the 400 meters. That's just crazy because you're kind of getting yourself ready. Then you're kind of, you're like, what do I do in these off days? And then you're anxious and you're watching everybody else compete. You just want, once you get it started, you want to keep going. The home crowd, if you were to sit down with this, and Michael Norman or, or Knight and some of the guys in your event, um, how, do you, how would you suggest that the, the crowd – turn that crowd and channel that, harness that into energy and not distraction. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the safe bet is to always just sort of, you know, tune the crowd out completely if you can, whether they're for you or against you. You know, trying to harness that, you know, is, look, you can't do anything about that. My, my philosophy has always been focus only, when you go out there, focus only on the things that you can control. You can control what's going to happen in that lane. You can control how you're going to execute this race, which is hard to begin with. <laughs> Extremely difficult to go out there and actually execute the race plan that was so easy to put together with your coach. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, gun goes off. Now you got to execute that, that, that race strategy. It's extremely difficult. So that's the one thing that you can control. You can't control anything that's happening in the other lanes with the other athletes. So, you know, I wouldn't even, you know, I wouldn't even try to. Don't mess with it. Don't mess with it because it may, it may, it may, it may, if you're unsuccessful mm -hmm. channeling that and it turns into a distraction. Right then it's a problem. So wait till you finish, drink it all in after. Absolutely. Do the job and then take all Absolutely. of it. Absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. I don't think we have the three hours that I have all of these questions <laughs> that I can ask you. But if, if I need to make sure we touch on this, these couple of things before you leave. Your takes on the sport are so, you're obviously fast. Like, congrats, it was awesome. Like, we love that. <laughs> but now... <laughs> You have such a good understanding of the marketing and the business side of the sport that seems like there's a disconnect that not everyone is seeing it through your lens. And I'm just, I want to hear more about your, your opinions and how we can improve and whatnot. But did you think that way when you were an athlete or did this only come later in, you know, your, your years of wisdom and 21 championships later with the BBC? That's a great question. And, um, and you guys are doing a great job. Just I want to put that out there. I've been I've been watching you, you guys. Can doing right, 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 you can right. You can say anything <laughs> positive about Sidious Mag and that camera. Sidious Mag is doing a fantastic job, channeling the sport, getting the athletes in here, and um, and they're going to do a great job of paying me for that. <laughs> All um, the seltzer you want. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. No, it's, it's a great question, Kyle. So you know, yes, I w here's 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 my backstory. When I started in my professional career, my best friend was an NFL player, and he played for 15 years in the NFL. And most of my close friends were NFL players. And I, I saw how they were treated, the sort of how they were revered, how they were respected as professionals, how they were treated, how they were financially compensated, the resources that were available to them from the NFL. And, and they were all track fans. And so they were all kind of like, We'd go out, for example, you know, and they'd be like, you know, y'all don't know who this is, you know, because they, they thought, you know, oh, because they all had run track, right? So even though they're NFL players, they're like, yeah, Michael, he's, he's the shit, right? You know, I'm world champion. And, you know, we roll up to this club and they're like, you know, all oh, these NFL players are like, y'all don't know who that is, right? <laughs> but anyway, so that was my experience. And I always felt, you know, as a professional, 
yeah, I should be treated as a professional. I saw what that looked like firsthand every day with those guys. And so I demanded that sort of treatment from meet organizers, from my sponsors, and I got it. I was running fast, but I got that sort of treatment and I got that sort of compensation. I got that sort of respect. And um, so I've always wanted that for other athletes because it's good. You know, when that happens and it's and it's it's heartbreaking, to be honest, as, a, as an athlete in this sport to see when that doesn't happen, because I know how talented these athletes are. I know how, you know, how how how, you know, respected they should be. So I've always seen that I finished my career. I was involved in all of my contract negotiations with my agent. I was very much involved in that process. Um, when I finished my track career, I, I did. I represented some athletes for a minute, you know, just because they were. It was Jeremy Warner who was coached by my coach. I was his mentor. And I didn't want to be in that business necessarily, but I couldn't, you know, find anyone who was, you know, thinking through that lens of how do we make sure that he's, you know, marketed as a professional and then represented Galen Rupp and a couple other folks. So, and then for, yeah, for 20, uh, for, you know, ever since I retired, I've worked for BBC, you know, through, and so seeing the sport through the lens of television. Um, I've been a part of an ownership group that owned uh, the Dallas Mavericks. We sold it to Mark Cuban. So I've been on the other side of sports business. So I've seen sports and I've been able to always come back to track and field and look at it through all of those lenses. And, um, and that's what gives me my perspective. We had the, con- the, the opportunity to sit down with Seb Co. And we were talking about how this championships isn't just about getting the sport popularized next year or you know just this week it's about it's all of the lead up to la 2028 and it's the ripple effects of what you do today you might not see immediately i think of atlanta so you know my hometown is the same as Derek adkins and after atlanta he came back to my elementary school and he brought his gold medal and that's one that's why i signed up for track and field and then being a long islander the goodwill games it's it's about the long-term vision for a lot of the things we do, right? Like it, you're not going to see, there's nothing that we can do today that will help us later today. Um, you know, I, I think that's a, that's a big question. So let's go back. I think that one of the things when it comes to what needs to be done in this sport, I think we have to go back and understand sort of where the sport has been, where it is now and where we're trying to go. So in the 90s, when I was competing in this sport, it wasn't amazing then. I was hearing then about the good old days when, Mm -hmm. you know, there was, you know, meets on television all of the time, the fastest people in the world, the track athletes were household names. I was hearing about that. And that wasn't happening in the 90s when I was uh, at my height of my career. And so that was a problem then. Television, you know, evolved from, you know, four channels, <laughs> you <laughs> know, to cable television. And then, you know, the Internet evolved to Web 1. Now we're going into Web 2 and Metaverse and all sorts of things, right? Dialed in. And the problem with track and field is that unlike other sports who have always all seen those things coming and how do we adapt our product to make sure that it continues to maintain its dominant position or wherever we're positioned and engage an audience and understand how fans, sports fans, and how people, you know, sort of consume media and their habits around media. Other sports have always had their finger on the pulse of that because they have to. Track and field hasn't done that. So where we are today is we are decades behind because nothing happened to Seb because Seb's I know Seb have known him well consider him a friend no I'm not sure if he still considers me a friend <laughs> but in all of the criticism of sort of the things that he has done or hasn't done one thing he had to do when he first got in, and I supported Seb's candidacy candidacy for for president one of the things he had to do at the very beginning was was clean up all of the governance issues because it was an absolute nightmare mm-hmm. but what hasn't happened and what I've, where I've been disappointed is the recognition that, hey, we are light years behind. We need a long-term program, to your point. We're not going to be able to do anything today. But the things that we can do, there are some things we can start doing today. In soccer, you've heard the on goal. We can stop scoring on goals because we score a lot of them in this sport. We can stop doing that. We can package the sport in a way that where it's actually attractive to media and attractive to maybe to outside investors who may want to come into the sport. 
But as long as we are doing things that, you know, continue to make our sport look amateur. Somebody tweeted at me yesterday and said, MJ Gold, why does it look so amateur? I mean, and what, what, one of the problems we have inside the sport is, and I said this in my, tw in my, re my, my reply is, typically what we do in this sport is we defend and attack immediately as opposed to asking, why does he think it looks amateur? And does it? And how do we fix that? You know, so I think that it, it, it's a lot, you know, and, and the question is typically, you know, well, what can be done? It's a, it, it's a multifaceted approach that has to be uh, taken to, to fix the sport. So I listen to that, and the first thing, obviously, is you can't solve a problem if you're not willing to recognize there's a problem. So you need that. If you come up with these solutions, are the people in place to affect that change as you see it now? So, no, they're not. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and look, with all due respect to Max Siegel and, and, and Sepco, they are responsible for everything from grassroots all the way through to masters. It's a lot. I think that what we're all pretty much focused on here, most likely, is professional track and field, right? Yep. And what does that even mean? How do you even define professional track and field? On the one end, you got Abby Steiner over here who's you know, rumored to be making $2 million a year. Good on her for that. On the other end of the spectrum, you know, you have someone else who maybe is already a world champion struggling to stay in the sport. It depends on what event they're in, you know. But it also, you could have a world champion javelin thrower. If, is that person making a really good living? Well, it depends. If they're American, no. If they're Finnish, yes. Mm -hmm. There's everything in the sport is it depends, it depends, it depends, it depends. It's too convoluted and no one can understand it and it's just not well defined. One of your takes that I personally agree with and it would be radical and people would hate you for it is that there are too many events. And I, I think of cricket and what they did as a sport. And, you know, they, they said, look, five day <laughs> matches. The Ashes test is not going to get done. Drinking tea and, yeah, yeah, the tea break. Yeah. It's too exactly. long. I mean, yeah. I can't even watch right. 30 minutes on Netflix without looking at my phone. <laughs> and so you've made the suggestion to, you know, we need maybe to focus our attention down a little bit on just a, a few or number of events. Yeah. And so, and people automatically assume that I would want to eliminate distance events. <laughs> We've, yeah, you went, he, came, he came at me on Twitter. I saw it. I, I held yeah, back. You want to defend yourself, Paul Chris? He, I, I mean, he roasted thrilling. you. I think you got ratio. I no, no. no. <laughs> Actually, the, the distance only, runners came out in my defense. Uh, without boy, me boy didn't they? They came hard and <laughs> fast. Des Linden right? came at you hard. You Des love short stories. Was, no, but Des got it. So yeah, she came. She came. She came right. She came correct. Um, but no, so here's the deal. I actually got criticized. I mean, the sprinters came at me when World Athletics said a few years ago, we need to eliminate some events from the Diamond League and we think the 200 meters should be eliminated. And I said, I think that's a good choice. I was not the world record holder at that time, but <laughs> it certainly it's my event. So I'm open and I think we all have to be open. The problem is we have this sort of insularity where everybody's like, it's my event, don't attack, attack my event. Don't attack my event, you know? And I think that uh, we, we, you know, th there's, we have to move away from that. We have to understand, and this is what World Athletics needs to do a better job of helping people, the sort of constituency of the sport, the athletes, the ex-athletes, the fans, you know, hey, we have to make some changes. Here's where we're trying to go. And if we can get here, it's going to be great, but we can't do it if we have to keep everything that we've always had if we have to try to spread this around amongst so many people and one of the things that i think that people don't really truly understand and one way to look at this is it's all based on tradition and it's 100 percent tradition tradition's great and it should be a part of the equation but the equation right now is 100 percent tradition and you wouldn't build so if you came out to build a sport and you knew you needed television, you knew you needed sponsors, and you knew those two were related, and you knew you needed fans, and you knew that their attention span was short, you wouldn't build this sport. <laughs> Not unless you, you wouldn't build yourself. this sport. Yeah. You wouldn't say, okay, we're going to have 10 things happening at once in a stadium. We're going to have, you know, events that, you know, are so varied 
I love that picture I tweeted out the other day of you know Shelly Ann Fraser Price and I think it was Krauser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, they play the same sport. Yeah. That's hard for people to get their heads around, you know, and it's very difficult when you have that sort of variation between athletes to be able to speak with one voice to people. You know, if you said, hey, you know what, we're speaking about distance running. You speak to a distance running community, relatively easy. If you're thinking about, hey, we're speaking about speed, fastest people in the world, relatively easy to get that message out there. But when you got to talk to those two and high jump and long jump and javelin throw and hammer throw and all of these different things, it's very difficult. So just to follow up, because you talked about the Ashes test, and I had that one time. I was visiting a buddy in London, and I went and played golf and came back three days later, and it was still on <laughs> yeah. TV. And they were still playing. But if that's a set, is this, is, this championship's 10 days long. Too long. We're asking a lot of our, our viewers and our fans to come in, and we kind of, I feel almost like we piecemeal it out to them. Here's a couple of finals here and there. How would you change the dynamic of that? Because we're asking people to spend a week and a half. Yeah, I think I think we have to think about, you know, as a sport right now, we have one foot in the sort of model, which I think is a, a valid model, this world championship model. It's a 10 day multi event, you know, lots of countries, lots of participants. It's a mini Olympics. People love the Olympics. So there's a market for this, mm -hmm. you know. But we have one foot in the Olympics, one foot in professional. Because a lot of what we're talking about may not apply to the world championships that world athletics puts on. But when there is no world championships, there is no Olympics, we try to have a professional sport, but it struggles. And I think that that may be a different thing. Mm -hmm. And that's where you then have your one-day meetings that don't need to try to be a mini Olympics on one day. Mm -hmm. You need to specialize in a a handful of events, and they don't need to, you know, look, I'm absolutely, if you look at my social media when I veer off of track and field and I'm on to politics and social issues, I'm all for democracy. I'm militant about that shit, right? But when it comes to business, this democracy that we try to do in track and field where it has to be equal across every event and all people does not work. It makes it extraordinarily difficult, and you can't do that in professional sport. You get the NCAA, right? You're trying to UW Oshkosh gets the same vote as Baylor or as Alabama, and and they're not they're not all the same thing. Right, exactly. I think the way to do it would you need a, a long runway, so you can't just say, hey, by the way, we're not doing the steeplechase this year. <laughs> you and you it have to be, hey, in in you know in six years this event is not going to be or like so it's not even affecting the people today so that way you know there is plenty of time starting at the youth level to kind of recognize that but i think especially in the democratic way maybe every year we do the the premier league thing and we all vote and we knock out the bottom <laughs> event and every year we get rid of one <laughs> yeah, and then know, when we have 10 events we're like you, you guys voted you for this relegated if you liked the javelin so much you guys should have gotten the campaign together and now we're just down to 10 events i i, I love it i love relegation in the premier league <laughs> it's because i always think about like in the nfl at the end of the season the team that's at the bottom nobody nobody's watching uh the 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 the, the Browns, right, mm -hmm. or the Lions. Nobody's watching them get that game because it's a it's a throwaway game, and people are actually wondering are they throw another way to get a number one draft pick, right? But in the Premier League, mm -hmm. everybody's watching to see, you know, are we going to get relegated? So, no, I like that idea, and I think that though, I think that there has to be some clear KPIs, you know, established around, you know, what events are retained and what events aren't. And and to that point, then it's like. These are the KPIs. This is where you guys rank. If you want it, you know, you better get out there and promote your event so that, you know, at the end of the year, it, it, it ranks high enough. But I think the, the point there is, is that, you know, again, there's this sort of insular thing with, with track fans and, and people in the sport that they immediately start poking holes when you say the most popular event, like, oh, popular. Someone said the other day, like, oh, popular is just some sort of thing that blah, 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 blah. And it's like, OK, you, you got a point, you know. What's, what's, what, what hits these KPIs that we know, what events hit these KPIs that we know would drive the casual viewer to actually watch? Not the already committed avid fan, and I think we get too caught up in that. Someone said to me the other day, they were talking about what events they felt like should remain in, in the sport based on 
which one's got the most applause in the stadium. <laughs> so we need to get outside size. of the yeah, stadium. Yeah. We yeah, already got those people in the right. stadium. That's not the, that's not, those aren't the people that we're trying to, to attract. Um, so, yeah, we need to understand yeah, and, and sort of lean into what we already know, that people's attention spans are short. They don't, they're not going to, you know, you know, look, look, the point the other day. With the 10K, okay. Yeah, with the 10K, <laughs> right? 10K stuff. So, you know, it was Twitter, so everybody immediately feels like, you know, Everybody's because the only thing people do on, on Twitter is fight. Yeah. So they immediately felt. They like don't I was, know that we already knew you were coming on the show. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. They, they're like, oh, you know, that's, it, it was. It was. I, I rarely get my feelings hurt. I almost got my feelings hurt that day, man. Really? With, yeah. With some of the, you know, you some, did it to yourself. I know, man. And it was your people. You need to. I was looking. I was waiting. I was like, because when's he gonna call his people off? <laughs> you never did. You just remained I silent. Just, I was like, God. I was like, like Des, you got this. I like, barely yeah, attacked. <laughs> No, but but here's the deal. Like you already recognize there's a problem. Yeah. That people look at the 10K and say, hey, it's 27 minutes, you know, and they say it's boring. But your position is it's not boring, right? Mm -hmm. So the point is is that we need to help people focus on the people who think it's boring and let's it's almost like saying to that person who says, you know, walks up to your restaurant and says, Man, you don't have anything here I want to eat. Are you going to attack that person? <laughs> are you going to try to get them on as a customer and say, you know what? Are there more people like you out there? Do you have friends that feel the same way you do? Because if so, I need to figure out how to get you something that you like. And if you feel like, well, you just don't understand the food, let me explain to you how unique this is. Let me explain to you how this 27 minutes. I just, I did have to just joke with you because, yeah, you showed the last 15 seconds, which I was like, yeah. that part is a bad That was exciting. good. That was a good 15 yeah. seconds. <laughs> but you didn't explain the other no. 27 minutes. <laughs> and, yeah, but, but no, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a matter of, you know, I think for the sport, understanding that trying to keep someone engaged for 27 minutes is hard. Mm -hmm. So how do we do that? And it's hard for us in television because we know, and that's, what, that's where I was coming from as well with that, and I know that our viewers want to see, our diehard distance fans want to see the whole 27 minutes. Every lap. That's difficult for us. It's very difficult for us because you want to see the whole 27 minutes. The field event, people want to see every rep, every throw, every jump. And, you know, we can't. But how do we, how do we make it better and how do we give them a little bit more of what they want? What have you made then? Because like we're t we're we're talking about twenty seven minutes being a long time, but then at the same time, I've just started to think that with F one, these are like ninety minute races that I I wasn't an F one guy two years ago, and all of a sudden, like I'm hooked and I'm I want to watch every moment of it. I get frustrated sometimes when they cut away to you know go do a replay or a crowd shot or anything like that, and so. You know, this is the boom that everyone, it's the hot topic over the last year or so that people have been talking about is how can we replicate that in track? It's cars, it's racing, humans and racing. Like there's pa there's parallels could be drawn there. Of course, they're more compressed. Like it's only 20 drivers, only 20 stories that really need to be told. And so, uh, you know, w what have you sort of made, you know, I've seen some of your tweets that, that you also take in F1 from time to time. Yeah. So, I mean, I know that sport well, been a fan since way back, go to, lots of races and we have clients in that space as well um so i know that's what well and it already you know it it was it was starting to suffer before liberty media uh bought them yeah. a few years ago and they've they took you know what was already good about the sport and then they you know they lucked up on drive to survive but you know that sport already had a huge audience. It's a team sport, so it's mm -hmm. almost like you know, like in Europe, it's almost like soccer, where you know my dad always represent, um, you know, supported Ferrari, so I support Ferrari. You know, so you always just have generational fan, um, fan, fan, fandom built in. This sport is different, you know. It's and so I don't think you can sort of make that comparison. One of the things in terms of just back to the point of. You know the you know the time that it takes. You know in Formula One, people love the pit stops because that gives you a break. It breaks it up. It's just not cars just going around in a circle like NASCAR. You know NASCAR people are waiting for what the accident, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I mean that's just I mean that's the reality of the situation. Whereas you know with track and field, unless you keep putting cameramen in the middle of the track, we're not going to have an accident. You right. know, but if you put the cameraman in the middle of the track, yeah, then, you know, yeah. like they did the other night, right. you know, you very might, exciting. you know, you're very exciting. Innovation, right? you might, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's a, the team thing is often people's 
idea that they'll throw out to us because we love having these conversations. It's like we just need pro track teams. And I, I think you're probably an interesting person to talk about both as an athlete but also as an agent. Can you imagine telling Jeremy Warner that he got traded to New York and has to go run for Frank Gagliano now? <laughs> like, how's that conversation going to go? It doesn't seem like our sport is set up in any which way for that team competition outside I, of t countries. I, I'm not sure. I think you could take, you know... Uh, a Tour de France type, you know, where it's like you're your own free agent. You know, you know, teams can't necessarily train or trade without without your consent. Uh, you could take a sort of, yeah, you could take that approach. Maybe a, you know, you could do countries. You could do a Ryder Cup type format. I think that there is something to. I was, I used to not be too too keen on the team idea because I thought, you know, inherently this is an individual sport and trying to turn it into a team sport typically was always just sort of mentioned be as a very sort of simpleton idea because mm -hmm. it was like, well, NFL is popular, so if we become <laughs> that, you know. But I think that, you know, I've heard some, some concepts um, that sound pretty interesting to me that I've been listening to in some conversations about team. And I think that I think there could be some opportunities there because, look, it would be exponentially easier to gain fans if you have teams. You just would need to do it in the right way. So I'm, I'm, I'm opening up to that idea. So I think of teams, but you touch it. Like the country is the most popular thing. And it has been here, whether you watch the Olympics or this. And I was texting the other night during the men's high jump with Dwight Stones, first guy over 230 as the bar went to 230. And he said, you know, I set that record 49 years ago last week. What? And he said it was, a, I was in Munich and it was just a triangular, but it was the U.S., it was West Germany, mm -hmm. and it was Switzerland. If we did the understanding now when you talk about the Ryder Cup, because they argue about who gets paid and should I be donating my time, but would it be easier if we had more, t more, more occasions where we had a Team USA to get behind? Because we used to always have the big USA-Russia duel, and that was a huge thing, and mm -hmm. we did that more and more often. And, and if you could structure that where you had four or five meets where we had a U.S. team, mm -hmm. right, and you wouldn't have to have the same people all the time. We've got depth. You, could, you, know, you wouldn't have to pick that. I feel like you could get sort of the team aspect, but you could get more people behind it because there's nothing easier, even as divisive as we are now, mm. to get behind red, white, and blue or get behind whatever flag you're on. Yeah, I think that there's some merit to that. You know, I think that a lot of these concepts, you know, need to be, look, we're, we're all, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume, you know, I don't know, I know your background. I don't know you guys' background so much, but... I'm going to assume that none of us here are, you know, marketing gurus or branding, you know. So, yeah, <laughs> so, so, so that my point is, is this. I think that a lot of people within track and field, myself included, throw out, and I try not to do it. I try not to, you know, jump into too many things of, you know, hey, I got the, the, the silver bullet here, you know. But I think that a lot of that sort of gets thrown around without understanding that any of these concepts – require a tremendous amount of, you know, sort of modeling and testing and understanding, you know, is this sustainable? Could this work? You can do a lot of work before you actually start to invest in and execute on those things. So I think that there's a lot of concepts, that one included. But, you know, I, my guess is that if you took the five most viable concepts that I've heard, and you put them through the proper process of understanding, okay, what could really work here, given all of the various different issues, problems, assets, you know, everything that, you know, you would need to consider around the sport itself and around, you know, just sort of the, the, the media landscape today, the, the entertainment landscape and how people consume their entertainment, their media and all of those different things, you would probably get down to one pretty quickly after that because you would find that it sounded like a good idea and it would be, but given all of these things, that does not work. And I think that people have to understand that that's a process. I want to pitch you on what I think is the easiest solution like that doesn't you know, change the whole landscape of the sport suddenly. I think one of the biggest problems that we have is that there's too many meets. And it's too difficult, therefore, to follow athletes. Like You don't know which meets you're supposed to watch. When are these athletes racing? Um, because you know, especially with the ranking system, which I hate, any meet can like you can just decide that a random high school pop up meet is worth as much uh, to getting a certain time as the Oslo Diamond League meet, and those shouldn't be 
the same opportunity. And so something that I think is that we are too quick to like give any accreditation to meets. I think we should be way more strict and it's like, no, and this is going to help decide who's a professional and who's not a professional. If you can't get your ass to Switzerland because there's one of the 20 professional meets in the year, if you can't find a way to afford that, then you don't get to compete in that professional race. And yes, we still have the diamond leagues and you know, obviously there's only a certain number of lanes, but there's a pre-program and athletes can have the opportunity there to compete in the pre-program before the main program. But like too many meets, just we, we need to decide this is the, these are the 20 possible meets where you can run qualifying times. They're all worth the same. No more of this A category, C category. And I just think that we need to take control, whether that's world athletics or maybe even just within the country, USATF, but stop just letting everyone decide that they are a professional meet. Did you hear what Max Siegel said they're going to do next year? I w- we haven't yet. But we I didn't go on the te- listening tour. I literally just got a text that he wants to do the show. So, oh. <laughs> so, so they are talking about more meets. And to your point. You got to get so rid of meets. Here's the problem with that. So you got Paul Doyle doing meets, right? You got other folks doing meets. You got too many meets already. And this is the, 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 the sort of one-dimensional thinking is a huge problem in the sport. Oh, let's just throw this against the wall to fix that problem, and that'll be it. So they're talking about more meets because athletes in the U.S. need more opportunities to compete. There's That's too many opportunities. <laughs> yeah, I, I 100% agree. Yes. But they feel like they can actually put money into – a set of meets that they would actually own and that they would actually launch that will give athletes more of an opportunity so they can say they've solved that problem. Willie Banks is saying, you know, hey, we're going to pay athletes a living wage of $80,000. Okay. I got another thought on that. But, <laughs> um, but um, the problem that that solves then creates another problem. A huge problem is that they even also, you know, talk about not enough head-to-head competition. Well, you just gave athletes more reasons <laughs> to not compete against each other because right. Natty got even more meets to go to. We're best friends now, just so you know. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, you still might have to apologize for your 10K stuff. I mean, you, you let them get beat up. But, yeah, I mean, that's, that, that, is, that is absolutely, a, a, you know, one of the problems. You have to think about all of these different issues, and so many continue to accumulate, sorry, continue to accumulate on top of each other, and you have to think about we have to solve all of these issues if we want to fix this sport, not just one, and certainly not one where that solving that one then creates another problem over here or exacerbates another existing problem. I think everyone's intentions, and I think that's always an important point to make, like everyone is doing what they think is the right thing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people who are putting on races like this and like Paul, like that's great for his athletes. He's an agent and he's, he's someone who loves the sport and is doing what he believes is best for his athletes and the sport and whatnot. But if everyone is trying to do that, then we run into these problems. And so I'm, it's, I'm not even opposed to USATF taking control and having this series, but then what they should follow up and say, and if you don't run your qualifying time for USAs at one of these meets, you're not getting in. And then guess who's all going to show up? Everyone at their meets. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, suddenly we have head to head competition. So if, if, if we go back to the movie, uh, Apollo 13, and there's a million, no, no, there's a million problems, right? But Gene Kranz, the mission director, finally stops and goes, what do we have on the ship that's good? So as we're trying to sort this all out, I look at track and field. What do we have on the ship that's good? That we go, okay, mm-hmm. right? We have athletes to promote and mm-hmm. that are as good as anybody. But like, what is it that where, if we start from a position of strength, it's where? Yeah. Great athletes. I mean, you look at what's happening here. And, and, and it bothers me, actually, when someone, you know, like, Max will come on here, and if you start asking him about the sport, he'll start talking about how great the athletes are. That's not our problem. Our problem is, is that nobody knows how great they are. The great competition that we're having here at this, this women's and men's 200 meters, come on. <laughs> I mean... That's, I mean, before the event, not the 1,500 meters last night, that was amazing. After the event and during the event, the buildup to that was like, yeah, Inga Brinson's probably going to win. And yeah, and maybe, you know, that's great too. But the buildup to these events, I mean, it's, it's, that's, that's great stuff. 
and it's stuff that we're not getting out there. You know, you're not getting that out there. So those are the assets. I mean, it's, we have right now, I mean, there's been, the, here's one of the things that highlights one of my problems with the leaders in this sport. Over the last several years, and certainly since Bolt left, they've been saying, we don't have enough personalities in the mm. sport. Bullshit. Right. Absolute bullshit. We saw them. Not enough. Oh, the, the, you know, <laughs> we, we don't, you know, athletes aren't running fast enough times, and they're not showing enough personality, and they keep putting it on the athletes. And that's, that's come on. It's, it's, it's bullshit. And they know it. And that's where, that's where I get really, really frustrated. Because, so to your point, John, you know, the athletes are great. They're the best. We do need to highlight them and not have them hidden in sort of the best and the, the best of the best. We need the best of the best to stand alone by themselves so that they actually are highlighted. But we have them sort of embedded in a much broader uh, volume of athletes who are good. They're the best, too. But we need the best of the best to be right there by themselves as and have that sort of cut off these are the professionals the best of the best and have it so that the structure of the sport to your point the structure of the sport makes it so that they have to compete head to head but they're also incentivized and rewarded for competing against one another Yesterday, sitting where you were, was Trayvon Bromel, Marvin Bracey, and Robert Griffin III. Two of those are Baylor Bears, yeah. like yes. me. Yeah, yeah, we should have had you on. <laughs> um, and when you say, like, the personalities of the sport and, like, people being critical, and I, we were fortunate enough to sit down with Trayvon earlier in the year for a show similar to this for a couple hours, so we got to know Trey well. I would never really spoken to Marvin the amount that I had, and those two guys had us dying of laughter, and then on the verge of tears, yeah. <laughs> on the edge of our seats, I mean, they were bursting with personality. And it's just impossible to capture that immediately after a race in a 15-second TV clip. And uh, it's just now a matter of how do we get everyone who is maybe the fringe fans that we're trying to attract to the sport. Because, again, we already have people in the stadium. Like, they're here. How do we get them to see how, I guess, dynamic of personalities those guys are? So here's what I think on that. I think two things. One, I think there's two stories to tell. And when I start talking about, you know, storytelling of athletes, you get the diehard fans saying, ah, Baja, you know, I don't, I just want to see the race. I don't want to get into the stories mm -hmm. behind, you know. We do. And yeah. <laughs> they, they do too. They don't even know that they actually do. Because it's like, you're following that athlete. You know who you want to win. It's not, if that was a robot out there running that time, you wouldn't be into it. So you already have bought into who that person is. They just don't even know. But I think that the other thing, though, is, is before we get to the backstory of the athlete and how they got here, we're not doing a good enough job of telling the story just of the competition. Why is this guy here? Why is this guy here on the line? We do a pretty good job of it with BBC. NBC doesn't do a great job of it, and I worked for them before, and they're still doing the same thing. It's like, okay, got eight people. Who are we going to focus on? This happens in the production meeting. Oh, we're going to mm -hmm. focus on this athlete. So the camera's always on that one athlete in the buildup, and they're just talking about that person. There's no competition story of, hey, here are the four main protagonists. Here's who, you know, why each one of them is here, and this is why each one of them, you know, could have an opportunity to win here. And now you as a viewer are bought into the race and you're going to get your payoff right away, unless it's the 10,000. <laughs> um, <laughs> but if it's a sprint, you're going to get a payoff right away. We're robbing ourselves of the opportunity to get people into that, you know, sort of, um, you know, in, in, to, to be honest, though, back to that point, though, you know, like, yeah, we, and, we have a chance to do that with, you know, distance events because yeah. we can tell that story and we can talk about it. And our guys do a great job. You know, I'm, I'm joking about, you know, the distance stuff. I love it. But, you know, with but it has its problem. But that's our problem with the sprints is that we're not telling that story, that competition story and building it up. You know, that 100 meter men the other night, you know, and the women's 100 meters was a great story that wasn't actually told enough in the build up. But, but to the other part of that, um, on your point there, is, is that telling the story of Trayvon Bamel, which is an amazing story, 
Marvin's story isn't as amazing as Raven said it was. Obviously, <laughs> well, we fact checked it with him. <laughs> I was like, it's still good hmm, though. Seven kids. <laughs> um, so that, there was a lot of embellishment that that <laughs> that, that the Hulk put onto that. But um, but no, it, you know, the, that story should have been told beforehand. But if you you know sort of you know take someone like Trayvon who has an amazing story, that story. I think realistically only is going to be picked up by mainstream media, not by us trying to push it out there. Mm -hmm. I don't care how much you push it out there. If the underlying sport that he plays, track and field, isn't of interest to mainstream media, then they're not going to go pick up that story. They're going to pick up that story when it's, hey, this is, this is a great product, track and field. It's something that we're interested in. We know that our viewers are interested in it. Now let's get into the personalities of the players. Listen, Melissa Jefferson would be a star if she was in the NFL, right? Junior year doesn't get recruited because she uh, gave a marrow transplant so her dad could live. Yeah. And now has to go to a small school because she doesn't get recruited, right? If that's an NFL player... That's, that's, that's eight minutes, it's Tom Rinaldi, he's making you cry, it's on Sunday yep. night, it's on Sunday mornings. Yep. You know, where do we find the space to tell that story? At the end, I think that, you know, here's how I look at this sport and where it is. You have a nucleus of the sport, which is just, what is this sport, what is this product? And then you have all of these ancillary things around the edge, like the stories of the athletes, the personalities, and all of those sorts of things. Until you fix this, those things, it's just not going to happen. You can, you can, those can be amazing because right now, I mean, you, you can't tell me that these aren't, you ask any athlete, you ask any person that, why, why do people watch the Olympics? When they watch the Olympics and they watch track and field athletes, well, those are some of the most amazing athletes. The things that they're doing are amazing. You can't improve on the athletes in this sport yet. And that, is, that should be the main thing, right? Yet mm -hmm. this sport sucks. And that, I mean, so that tells you right there, you have to fix the structure of the sport. And I think to your, your point, you know, we, we certainly agree on these, on these couple of things that, you know, the structure of the sport in terms of too many events, it just sort of, you know, it creates all of this noise and inconsistency. People don't know who a professional is. They don't know how the diamond, if people turn on and you actually do see a track meet, you don't know what it's for, what it means. How does it relate to this? We have world championships now. Someone, someone turns on, seeing the world championships now, I was watching a meet two weeks ago. How does that one relate to this one? And it's just all sorts of inconsistencies like that. And I, I, I tweeted out earlier this year because I was watching one of the, the um, early season meets in May. And I was like, I would think that somebody's watching this and they see like, so all of the, like five of the athletes of the eight in that race have on the same uniform. Does that mean they're on the same team? Mm. Well, yes, maybe, but sometimes no. In this case, no. But if they're at world championships, yes. But if they're competing against each other and they're from the same country, they got the same uniform on and they're on the same team, but they're not kind of really, you know, working and helping each other. It's, it's a mess. Something that you can hopefully give us good insight into just because you've been in the TV and broadcast world is the, and we only ever get in trouble for this. We don't have rights to, to the stuff, but the ability to share and, you know, if you wanted to even just like, tweet something out from the track you'll get a strike down in a second and also then that makes finding the races more difficult you never know where anything is going to be on you know you have to have a flow track password and a runner space password which you're you're paying for and hopefully cable you're paying for and which and channel the other ones will tell you that the stuff is on the other place so that whole so everyone's very broken. protective of what they're doing and so from a fan's perspective from our perspective, I mean, much of what we do is we just want to aggregate and tell people everything that's going on and where you can watch make and it why easy. it matters and make it easy for people. But even still, it's hard for us. How do we fix that problem? Because it's all over the place right now. Yeah, and I think that, you know, that's one of the things that, um, that world athletics should be, should be trying to fix. And they're the only ones that can. They're the only ones that can say to all of their rights holders, hey, let's, let's figure out if you guys are going to try to help us grow this sport, Let's figure out how to give up a little bit of these rights so that, yeah, people can post and share on social media. And so, you know, sort of organizations like yours and there are more of these popping up. And, and I think that is very helpful to the sport. You know, it's much more of a grassroots sort of, you know, movement to get people interested in the sport um, and help existing fans, you know, help to retain them. Because a lot of fans are going to go away if they don't have this sort of, you know, insight 
you know, into behind the scenes that, you know, larger organizations, I mean, BBC is a huge organization. It's, it's difficult for us to do what you guys do, you know, but it's easier for you to do it. Um, so I think that it's up to, to World Athletics to say, hey, you know, this is going to help grow this sport. It's going to be better for you in the long term in the rights that you're paying for, for you to give up a little bit of those rights, you know, and just allow this and how can, and, and talk to them and have that conversation. Like, how can we do that so that you don't feel like it's infringing on what you're paying for? Um, and I think that they'd be open, but I don't think that there is that sort of thinking, to be honest, within an organization like World Athletics. And I think that there is enough noise outside, you know, with people like us saying, oh, how do we do it? And we, I think that nobody has any faith or even sees World Athletics as the one to be the, you know, sort of, you know, entity sitting in the middle that could do that, that you feel like you have to do it on your own. And that's, that's hard. It's the same thing that we talk about, you know, the athletes. Athletes need to show more personality. You're not going to provide any resources for them to do that. You're not going to, you know, provide those, you know, come to them and say, hey, we have the cameras, we have the production team, we have the production crew to get that information out there and to be able to take your time. You got to do it yourself. People say athletes need to compete against each other more. And Max said, I'm talking to the agents about that. You're going to leave it to the agents and athletes. <laughs> that needs to be structurally in the sport. You have that control. Like you said, have fewer meets and make it worth their time. You're pushing it over to the athletes and having them because everybody in this sport. So there's two things that I notice that people in this sport do. We all do it. Fans, athletes, coaches, you know, everybody in this sport. It's like, you know, sort of it has to be, you know, sort of done outside of the organizations because they don't do anything. And then the other thing is. We always got our hand out looking for charity. We deserve, I've, I've, I've been meaning to tweet this, but I'll just say it on here. Right you know, I want to see a know? live Michael Johnson tweet being uh, The thing is, like is you know, if, if, if we will help ourselves in this sport as soon as we eliminate the word deserve from our category, ca uh, vocabulary. I'm so sick and tired of hearing people talk about what is deserved. We all know that, but you don't get what you deserve in business. You get what you, you earn, and when you, you have to provide value. You have to provide value. I'm, it sounds harsh, but you know, saying that athlete deserves a contract, look, most shoe companies, are, are it, this is already charity for them. They're really not getting much value back from signing track athletes. I'm a, it, mm -hmm. honest truth. They're really not getting much. Track athletes don't sell shoes. People are like, oh, they're making all of that money on those shoes and all of that. No, they don't. I mean, Running shoes sell regardless, and nobody ever turns on a track meet and sees an athlete running in running shoes. I, I always think, you know, people don't think in terms of ROI. Like, if you're going to give an athlete, you know, X thousands of dollars, well, it's like, are you going to sell that many, incrementality of that many more shoes <laughs> because of it? Um, you know, in my professional career, I think the value that I provided probably more than anything of just, you know, showing up to races and running mediocre times <laughs> was putting on a track meet of my own. And that's probably when I moved the needle the most for Hoka at the time, you know, like once, once I was doing, I was creating events and leveraging my role as a professional athlete, but it wasn't just showing up and being one of 15 guys on a start line in Italy that didn't do anything. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it's, we have to understand that if you if we're going to get any of these things, you know, we, we, people also say, you know, all oh, the media, you know, television stations, they, they should be covering this. They should be covering that athlete. They should be, you know, having them on late night shows. Why? <laughs> we, we <were laughs> why? Why should why should that. why should they be doing that for what? What is in it for them? You know, mm -hmm. and, and I don't think we ask ourselves enough. Would you be doing, you know, something outside of your. I mean, like you've already, I'm like, you know, I've already given up all the lollipops I had for the day. You know, now I got to charge for them. You know, what I mean, it's like, you know, the charity part of it is, you know, are we going to be a charity? Are we truly professional athletes here looking to be, you know, valuable? And I think that that's a problem in the sport. And I think that because a lot of people have, honestly, the reason those things happen is what's really sad for me. And, and it's, I think that a lot of people had given up on the sport, even people within the sport, that it's always just going to be here, you know. The one thing that is a real positive for me, though, is I haven't, I haven't seen this much conversation as of late over the last several months around, hey, what mm -hmm. needs to be done 
there's a lot of that conversation now going on with athletes. I think you guys, you know, and, and other folks in your space are sort of, you know, um, stirring up those conversations. And those are the conversations that need to be had because I think that the athletes and, you know, coaches and sort of diehard fans and ex-athletes in the sport need to truly understand how the sport works and where it's been and where it is and how sports business works. And um, but to start asking the right questions and start having the right conversation. And I think that's happening now. So this is good because we're only an hour in and I'm, I'm down to only about 12 questions left that I have for <laughs> you. So this is great. I want to circle back to one of when you talked about you guys, both of this, the, the getting the video and sharing it. And there's nothing more. The other night, Mondo Vault 616. I'm like, can we at least shove it in top plays, get it somewhere? Top plays come out. Baseball, baseball, soccer league I've never heard of in Finland. Blah, blah, blah. And I go, wait, where was Mondo? Video embargo, couldn't show him. There was I, actually the viral tweet of an old nothing, video of Mondo. <laughs> there's nothing, more, nothing that grabs you like the pole vault, right? Like people yeah. go, wow, that's unbelievable. I always say, like if you watch tennis on TV, you can go, oh, I can go to the park and play tennis. I see golfers on TV, I can go play golf. Like if you just saw, hey, it's the pole vault, and I could go to the park, and there was pole vault mats, and like, it'd be the number two killer of young men in America. I don't know did that, that's right? True. But the fact that you couldn't show that is, it's, that's criminal. And how they don't understand, whoever it is, that if I show that, I'm going to want to watch him next time if you show him on your channel or my channel or whatever. Like we, that's where instead of protecting the, my piece of the pie, throw the damn pie. I, this has been a, a situation in track and field for so long at varying different levels where you're talking about this is the you know, governing body. Now, we've got to maximize our revenue and we can get a little bit of money from these you know, rights holders and we can maximize that by mm. saying, hey, you know what? That won't be seen anywhere else but on your network, right? It's the same situation with, you know, sponsors for athletes. World Athletics can go to, you know, their sponsors and say, there will be no other signage in the stadium. Right. Not even on the athletes. Because we're going to limit how many sponsors they can get. Because they get a little bit of revenue from that. But it would grow larger if you gave the opportunity for athletes to actually have however many sponsors they want. And then you have athletes out there actually acting as your sales associates, basically getting their own sponsors, bringing them into the sport, and then that sponsor decides, you know what, I'm going to sponsor some more athletes. Doesn't hurt. Jim Furyk looks like a NASCAR driver, right? When you go out and play golf, they've got, he's got here and I mean, here and on the back and the hat. Exactly. The only reason they limit it is to, you know, so there's always, there's this limited amount of resources and funds, and they try to maximize it, and, and, but no one wants to make the bold decision to, hey, you know what? We're going to go out there and try to grow this, you know, and grow this. But it's going to call for us to back off a little bit on some of these traditional revenue streams and things like that. And it's it's a it's it's almost like everybody, like you said, everybody just kind of protecting their little pot. It's it's a tiny pot, and if and this is a case, you know, within the sport as well, you know, with athletes and agents and things. It's like I got my little piece, and I'm not going to let go, and I'm not willing mm -hmm. to sacrifice at all. I heard from a photographer that they had taken a picture of an athlete in the stadium and a brand wanted to repost it, but there was other logos in the background. Mm -hmm. And then it was like the trademarks and the logos, and it's just like every possible way you want to cover the sport, there <laughs> seems to be a roadblock. So I'll limit this to the, my 12 down to two, and here's the other, but that may open a <laughs> huge can of work because we're all in the pro. We've been so much here pro, how do we fix, how do we fix this, how do we fix this? But you talk about Baylor and I spend so much time covering the NCAA and the SEC, and I look at this meet and I watch athlete after athlete because that be is the feeder system, mm -hmm. essentially, and mm -hmm. that model seems to work. Uh, I am terrified as conferences realign and football gains more and more power that the sport at the NCAA A level, uh, NCAA level is going to get just steamrolled, and that's going to hurt long-term with athletes that come into the program. Are you, do you have an eye on that? Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, so a lot of the Olympic sports were facing cuts over the last uh, few years. And I just want, I mean, those sports have always been funded by basketball and football mm -hmm. with more money coming in. I mean, UCLA just said the other day, now their whole situation, I live in California and the Board of Regents are now saying, wait a minute, you didn't come to us about this deal. Right. <laughs> so that may be, I, I think it'll happen. But, um, but UCLA did say before that, that, you know, the money that they feel that they will get from the rights from joining the Big Ten will allow them to continue to save some spots. To, to, to save some, some sports that may have been on the chopping block. So, 
you know, I, I'm not sure. I think, you know, I guess I'm hopeful because you're right, that, that system um, is why the U.S. just dominates the metal table and why it looks like a mistake this morning. I was like, <laughs> that, you know, right. um, but that is why, because we have the best development system in the world. And, you know, in my company, we work with a lot of our clients are Olympic federations around the world. and They would die for this system. They don't have it, this collegiate system. And um, so it's, it's, it's a great system. It was in the years even pre-pandemic and certainly during the pandemic, it, it started to come under threat because a lot of the, the universities were, were coming under significant financial pressure and, you know, and they're having to cut sports and track and field was one of the ones that they were um, you know, attempting to cut, but for some efforts of some really good people out there, really sort mm -hmm. of grassroots you know, sounding the alarm. Um, but I'm hopeful that because those those programs have always been uh, again funded primarily through the basketball sure. and, and, and football. So, if more money is coming into basketball and football, maybe that means you know that you know some of these programs will be saved. But I'm I'm not sure. With all right. of the conference realignment, it's crazy. UCLA's track team is going to have to go all the way over to the East Coast for conference. Right. <laughs> it's kind of you know I right. don't know. It still doesn't make sense, right? Clemson's trying to cut their track team while they're building an indoor <laughs> mini golf course and a slide for the football team and get another, you know, well, Baylor's got that, right? You got how many different helmets, right? Like we could put away one helmet and pay for your cross country team for a year <laughs> by just not getting an instead of helmets. And, and I pick Baylor, but Oklahoma State, name any of these teams mm -hmm. that have, you know, 14 different uniform combinations, like just what you, what you spend to outfit you could keep teams going for another year. It's ridiculous. On the, in that spirit, in addition, this will be my final question, in addition to wanting to know what you could run for 400 today. <laughs> um, this is a, an idea that Mac pitched to me for the first time, like I heard it a while ago, and then I saw a couple other media outlets discuss this, and to some people this was blasphemy. The suggestion that maybe NCAA athletes and professional athletes shouldn't be on the track at the same time, that it's the only sport where that's really happening. You know, you don't see the best college basketball players in an NBA game at the end of the season just because they're really good at basketball. And I, depending on your take, there could be already. some backlash. But I think when we talk about the professionalism of the sport, it's are you a pre professional or are you an amateur? I saw that. Yeah, and it was it was interesting. I didn't I didn't get too deep into that one. But here's my here's my thoughts on that. I think where that becomes I see where it's a problem. I think where it's a problem is because you don't have the clearly defined. Someone said this was really interesting to me. Someone said. U.S. championships, U.S. nationals, collegiate athletes have an advantage because they've got, you know, the resources behind them. The university is going to fly them there. They got physios. They got, you know, all of these resources. Professional athletes don't have that. Really, the best of the best do. So the problem is, to your point and what we've been saying, this layer down here that are really good, really good, but you're not the best of the best. And so... Someone said this too. And when I, we, I, there was something that was going around on Twitter, and they talked about, you know, well, maybe those athletes. I'm just, I'm, I'm prefacing this so that it's not me saying. Yeah. That. yeah. Mm -hmm. We maybe won't those, cut this up to make maybe, it seem like maybe, it's your idea. Maybe those athletes shouldn't be there. That's what someone else said, and and it, it may be true. When you're complaining about, you know, all of the money that you had to spend, I get it. You know, the sport allows you to be there. But maybe even sometimes for your own good, maybe you should not be there. There needs to be a cutoff at some point. I mean, we have in the training business, we train athletes. A lot of our primarily, it's mostly NFL, and you know, but we have guys every year who didn't get drafted, and they're like, "I think I can make it." And this is before there was any XFL or any, you know, all of these, you know, summer, mm -hmm. spring you know, professional football leagues to try to be a feeder system into the NFL. And they would, they would, they would you know, mortgage, they, they, you know, crowdsource money from family to try to train. And you know that and you just knew some of them like you're not going to make it. I can't knock you for, you know, your dream. But if you're not there, you know, because it would be interesting to look at, you know, the athletes that went to U.S. Nationals that spent money trying to get there but still didn't get even get into the finals. Maybe you shouldn't be there because that's who I think the collegiate athletes have an advantage over. I don't think the collegiate athletes have an advantage over the guys who are in the, 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 the athletes who, you know, are most likely going to make the team. I, I, I kind of want to 
just keep bringing you on every single day. Maybe we do a monthly podcast or something like that with you, me, and Kyle. But uh, John, you can come. Or we just uh, have you moderate uh, moderating a uh, debate between him and Max would be just phenomenal <laughs> on YouTube. But uh, this roadmap to LA twenty twenty eight. What do you hope to see, like the sport in a healthy state by then? Like, what is it? What does that sort of look like? What reforms and changes do you want uh, to see in place by then? Yeah, one thing I would I, I'd like to clarify on that. So I sit on the board of directors for LA Twenty Eight. I sit on the executive board for LA Twenty Eight. I'm very involved with that. We're very excited. Um, you know, just announced the other day. Um, you know, the dates for for the games, and super excited about it. But the Olympics. Track and field, Olymp Olympic track and field is very different from track and field. Everyone's still mm -hmm. going to tune in. The stands are going to be packed. Right. Very healthy on the Olympic no, level. Yeah, no doubt about it. And that is because the IOC does a very, very good job of protecting their product, building that product. It is sacred to them. You know, they do a very good job of that. So people will watch the Olympics, and track and field is just a part of that. It is the premier Olympic sport, but it is a part of that. So this idea that, you know, this championships and the LA 28 Olympics, you know, are going to book in, you know, and it, that sounds good. It's something, I mean, Seb's a politician. He's very good at that. But what does it all mean? You know, I haven't, you know, one of the things that disappointed me most was the idea that this is the start of the bookend. And LA 28 is the is the is the is the uh, the other end. And by then, we want to be a top five sport in the U.S. Right? That's what Seb said. And he talked about this being the start. Well, if this is the start, then the pre-start is make sure that this is successful. You make sure this is successful by making sure stands are full on day one. Everybody can get their visa. When you know that visas to get into the United States are the most difficult, you know of pretty much any country out there, and especially in a pandemic. So you get ahead of that. But that's typical. It's just talk. When, it, when you're saying that this is the start and we want to come out of this, you can't, you can't be planning during this. What was the plan going into this to make sure that this end of the bookends is successful? What is the plan coming out of this? I haven't heard the plan. You guys asked him the other day kind of about the plan, and he went into a long thing about, you know, and it sounded really good, because Seb always sounds really good. But it didn't actually lay out a specific plan to attack the challenges that this sport faces, and it didn't talk about, you know, a specific plan. Like he talked about, and it's a good, I got this from him, and it's great. I think he said something like 50 million recreational runners. I don't know if that was, I think that's just in the U.S., which is fantastic. That's great. How do we connect this sport with those people? What's the plan? What's the strategy to do that? Youth track and field, high school level, youth track and field, most participated sport by youth athletes of all of them. That's fantastic. How do we connect that to this? How do we make sure, do, do, did, did anybody do anything to make sure that they all know where to find this championships on their television on so or streaming? Hard to find. No. We put out a nice graphic on Twitter <laughs> that hopefully made it easy. But I think I retweeted that. Yeah. I'm just thinking yeah. if only my wife and I agreed on as many things as I agree with you on <laughs> being a good place. <laughs> but it's funny when you talk about what's the plan. Are you coming on to me, man? You Come try, on you now. Try, you try, you try, you try, I, I, well, we, we, make, we make a good I mean, maybe no, we best would make a good friend. couple. Maybe. Yeah. That's funny. Uh, but we heard Rye is running for president. He announced yeah. last yeah. night. Yeah. It, you know, if you ever want to throw it out, you might have my endorsement. I'm going to let Rye have Director that. Director of Communications <laughs> right here. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming Absolutely. on. Absolutely. We didn't get his pick in the, in the 200s. Oh, yeah. Oh, are you going to go on record? No, yeah, give, you know, give us a synopsis of what you think. Yeah, yeah. So here's what I think is going to happen in the men's 200. On the men's side, the lane draw is is massive for that. And it's great. The lane draw has actually set this up to be a really good race. Noah's on the outside in six, I believe. And he likes the three, outside. Yeah. That's the preferred lane he on likes, the track, at least as it's listed. Well, he he just likes being as far to the outside as possible. When he choose, when he gets to choose his lane, he would always choose the outside. So he's where he wants to be. Arian is the best turn runner I've ever seen. So he's right where he needs to be. It's good praise. So at, at 18, which is just a phenomenal. I mean, he, he's, yeah. So, so he's right where he wants to be. And Noah, obviously, I mean, there's always that thing with sprinters, especially in the 200 meters, is my main competitor behind me, right? 
or or is he in front? The, the the sort of simple narrative there is I want the I want I want to be behind so that I can see, right? Noah has never cared about whether or not he doesn't care he does not care where his competitors are. He just knows I want to be in this lane, closer to the outside, and that's where he is. And I would imagine that Arian being as young as he is and having his main rival in the race would want him to be on the outside, which he is. So there it's set up that my my point there is it's set up to be an amazing race. I think Arian will come off the bend again with a lead like he did at the US Championships. And I think that, you know, where where, you know, I can't tell you what's gonna happen is whether or not Noah's gonna be able to run him down again. And Noah says my speed is superior, and I know that. And Arian said, it's not over. So <laughs> that's perfect, right? That's on the men's side. On the women's side, um, Sharika is just all by herself. And uh, it's just a matter. And Shelly Ann, I think, is, I mean, she raised her game. I think she's second. And then I think it's a matter of whether it's um, Dina, Elaine, Clark. No Steiner. One of those three for the no for bronze. Oh, I'm sorry. Steiner is second, not Shelly Ann. Okay. Wow. That, she went from off the board to second. That's <laughs> yeah. really good. Yeah. <laughs> so through. the only thing is, is you know, I'm 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 hedging a little bit on that because Abby looked really tired yesterday. Mm -hmm. So and mm -hmm. someone tweeted out this morning how many races she's had now how how much yeah. distance she's covered oh, and it's yeah, a it's lot. Like 40 10 k. Yeah. It's a lot. <laughs> fifty four. <laughs> so was her, four last night I, was her fifty fourth race. So if she if she's still you know if she doesn't have one more good race then she's out of it and it goes the way I just 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 uh, just said if she if she can run if she's got one more good race then I think that she's I think she's second I don't think she can beat Sharika. But if she can run her best race, then I think she's second. Love it. I can't wait. Yeah, it's, it's going to be exciting. Amazing. All right, Michael, thank you so much for taking the time to sit Absolutely. down with us. We are now going to toss it over to another Olympic gold medalist, two-time Olympic gold medalist, Ashton Eaton. Kyle, you got the chance to sit down with him. What sh can the viewers expect in this conversation that's about to air? Yeah, so Ashton and I, um, just we, we wanted to have a real raw conversation about life post-running and post everything um you know our lives after our professional careers and what we're up to now but also the things that were really useful to us that we took from our athletics career and have been able to apply to our corporate careers and you know i think this conversation is hopefully really helpful for professional athletes today maybe there's parents maybe there's coaches or agents just you know I, there's some really valuable insight and i know that transition is something that we talk about a lot in sports, and uh, hopefully our experiences can be of some use to someone watching at home. So, it, I mean, we, we I really enjoyed speaking to Ash, and I've never had this many words with him before, but then afterwards, Mac told us we should have a podcast on Sidious. So there you go. Maybe stay tuned. You're going to have two different shows, one with <laughs> yeah. Michael, one with Ashton. Here's Ashton Eaton with Kyle Merber. Hey, by my normal co-host, Chris Chavez or John Anderson. Instead, I'm sitting down with the man who needs no introduction, two-time Olympic gold medalist, former world record holder, Ash Neaton. And I'm really excited about this conversation because we're gonna we'll probably touch on some sure. track and field and athletic stuff, but we I also hope we do. Talk. That's all I know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know, it's been a few years since you have finished competing. Uh, it's been a couple of years since I've finished my career and. I guess I want to start by kind of catching up. What have you been up to? What is life like, you know, now that you're retired from your first life? Yeah, I, I'm glad you said retired from your first life because I don't want to be fully retired. And I think a lot of people see athletes who retire with some success and they're like, oh, you can just retire and like go chill now. It's like, no, I really can't. <laughs> not baseball players. Yeah, not yeah. baseball, not football players. But um, I think first and foremost, the priority that I'd like to highlight is the family. Yeah, let's do that. So, you have some uh, exciting news. Yeah, so we have our son. His name's Ander. He's two and a half. Um, and we just had our second child, our daughter. Her name's Elian, and she's six weeks old. Congrats, man. Yeah, yeah. So we're pretty excited about that. What uh, are you doing here? What am I? Yeah, <laughs> no, trust me. It's like, I'm going to go down and have a great day in Eugene. Brian, you just chill up in uh, at home and take care of the kids. No. Um, it's, it's actually insanely challenging like way harder than decathlon way harder than sports just making sure that you've created this life and 
they, uh, you know, survive and have like good experiences. Um, but it's also, it's also great. It's like the most rewarding thing I've ever done. Um, so that's really kept us busy for the last couple of years. But initially after sport, we moved to San Francisco. So at the end of 2017, which is the year we announced our retirement, uh, moved down to San Francisco. And the whole reason was to just change the environment. I was always interested in science and technology. Brianne kind of wanted to do something new. So we thought, let's go to where like the startups are happening and the VCs and the money and figure out like, what is all this startup stuff about and, and science and tech about? So when I was down there, it's been about a year just networking. Okay, um, that's what I was going to ask. How quickly, yeah. like, did you enjoy any time by the pool before diving in? Yeah, I mean, that year in 2017, I think we like officially announced retirement January of that year. Spent the whole rest of the year actually visiting friends and family quite a bit and going back to the people who supported us, but that we also neglected to try to achieve some of the things that we wanted to achieve. And so that was really good. And then we packed up and moved. And then that whole kind of 2018 was meeting people. And maybe this will help um, athletes who are in a transition. Largely or, the point of the conversation. Yeah, exactly. Guess, yeah. Or, or thinking about going through it. I was just like just literally cold emailing people. I was looking up companies who I thought were doing interesting things. It's kind of like, it, it's like the fact that you are the, the, <laughs> yeah. the best athlete in the world now sending cold yeah. emails. It's, yeah. Talk about a humbling experience and you probably had to swallow some ego there at times. Well, I, th I think yes, to a certain degree, but it, I'm, it didn't, um, how should I put this? I didn't think I was like that great, if you will. So it wasn't hard for me to just, I, I didn't feel like that was me coming like down or something like that to, to try to send emails to people I had no clue, you know, what they were working on. And I, I knew they probably wouldn't know me. Um, but I did use that success in sport to, I think, as like an attention grabber to try to see if they would listen. Yeah. yeah. So in some of these emails, it was like, hey, two-time Olympic gold medalist, just retired, very interested in your field. Would you be willing to talk? And people respond. Yeah, they actually responded. Yeah. A lot of people said yes. So I went on a lot of visits, um, saw some cool stuff. And yeah, ultimately met some folks, got to San Francisco, joined a software startup. Um, and the goal there was actually just learn from an incredible team about how companies work. Because I was thinking, man, interested in this stuff. I'm interested in companies and startups. I can go get my MBA or I can just like join a company. So I just joined a company. Um, was there for about a year, learned a ton. I was the 12th person on the team. Everybody was a software engineer. And for me personally, I was always juggling, should I just work or go to school? Mm -hmm. Because I was very interested in engineering. And then I said, all right, to hell with it. I'm going back to school. So 2019, I left that company and started studying for mechanical engineering. Where were you doing that? Uh, I was doing actually community college in San Francisco because my degree at Oregon was just like a Bachelor of Arts. I didn't do any of the math or science. Um, frankly, I was a little bit too afraid to do that and also not spend a lot of time on it. So I started these classes and I was like, why did I wait so long to do this? I mean, I just fell in love with physics, fell in love with um, chemistry and engineering. And at the same exact time, I went and did like a panel at Intel. Um, for as an athlete? As an like athlete. Just yeah. So they invited me. They said, come speak with Simone Biles. We want to kind of, I think they had just announced being an Olympic sponsor. And um, I said, sure, why not? And it was there that I was like in the green room. And somebody who worked at Intel in their Olympic technology group, didn't even know that existed, was like, hey, we're doing something with um, human performance and cameras and engineering. Um, just heard that you're going back to school for that. Would you want to work with us? I was like, you okay. didn't have to email. I didn't have to email. <laughs> they, I know. It came just, to you finally. Yeah. And I was like, okay, yeah, let's, let's try it out. So started out as a contractor and then did that for a year while I was doing school. And then COVID hit. So this is 2020. Um, and I was like, all right. And then we had our son as well. So COVID hit, we had our son, and I was like, I'm going to go to work full time, stop the school thing. And we were focusing on a project for the Olympic Games, actually. And we piloted it here at the U.S. Trials uh, in 2021. So worked on that for two years, did the project through 2021, and um, now I'm basically part time and full time engineering again. Very cool. So I guess, you know, first off, what's it like being here now, yeah. you know, as a suit? <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. Well, it was it was strange because the project that we did at Intel involved, um, I, I'd actually, I don't know if some 
of the people have seen the graphics that they show after the sprint races where it's like yeah, the heat, yeah, the heat yeah. map. So we did that last year um, in kind of a more complex way. And our whole goal was like, how fast are these athletes actually running in the 100? And can we show where they hit their top speed? Can we show people what actually goes down in a sprint? Because it's not just acceleration the whole time. Yeah. Um, and that went well. And that was the first time I was back at Hayward at a major competition, but I was behind the scenes. I was like in the production truck area, which is pretty gnarly, <laughs> by the way. I mean, this whole setup, like this stuff is very hard. Uh -huh. And I know, you know, athletes do their thing, but to promote and show the sport, there's so much work that goes involved. So I got an appreciation for that. But it was really, really, um, I'd say interesting and weird being behind the scenes. I don't it's know. It's weird. Like you kind of want to be out there, but I you're do. also, it's like, you're not as stressed. You get to it's enjoy it <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, it's true. I mean, live production is actually pretty stressful. I'd say the same as being an athlete getting ready to go into the blocks. You have to like perform in the moment. Yeah. Um, so there, there is that aspect that I brought to it, but I don't know. It's just, it's, it's a different world. One that I wasn't used to, um, but one that I felt like I should contribute to because I think it does contribute to the sport growing. So, yeah. Well, so going back to something that you had said earlier, yeah. you know, touching a little bit on my experience as well. I had this thought that when I announced my retirement from yeah. my career, yeah. like I, oh, I post on Instagram, like I'm retired that immediately, <laughs> like my LinkedIn inbox would be full. Yeah. yeah. And it, like, you know, I, I had a few followers, a few fans, and I assumed one of them was hiring and yeah. would be interested in bringing me on board and, of course, paying me triple that I was making as an athlete and, like, yeah. we'd live happily ever after. And so this wasn't the case. They just said everyone was very happy. They were congratulations. Yeah. And then slowly it turned into just a lot of compliments. Like, you're going to do so well in whatever you decide to do next. Yeah. Like, anyone who hires you will be so lucky. Right. Okay, and where are they? Yeah. And like, kid, do you have anything for me? And so, did you ask that question? Well, in private conversation, not via Instagram, okay. but yeah. no, you know, as people followed up, and you know, what are you going to do? What are you interested in? Yeah, you know, my advice first and foremost is those, con and this is what I learned. Well, first of all, what what were you interested in? But did you know? Uh, I had a vague sense, and it was a journey, and this is. I think what you probably did right is taking your time to really figure it out and have a lot of those conversations. Sure. Because as I had those conversations, what I wanted to do changed and evolved. Interesting. And I would talk to different people. I think initially I said, I want to be in the sport. Like mm -hmm. that, you know, I don't want to coach, but I would love to work for a shoe company or, you know, somehow stay involved in like a corporate capacity yeah. in the sport. That's, that's the first thing everybody says, oh, you're going to coach. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and <laughs> then, <like>, nope. <laughs> and then, as I had those conversations, I realized the things that I wanted to do didn't line up with like just selling shoes. At least, yeah. you know, at, immediately after, I'd been trying to sell shoes for the previous seven years as an athlete. Sure. I didn't want to keep trying to sell shoes. Sure. And so, as I had those conversations, and I learned about jobs that I didn't know about existed. Yeah. Like you just have to be in that exploratory phase for so a really true. long time because so the it, now like thinking back to those initial conversations I had compared to what I am now doing and happy doing completely different. Yeah. I mean, I think in a lot of ways it could be like sport in the sense that, um, when you were on the playground doing your thing and then eventually got into running, um, or, as athletes getting getting into whatever it is, it's not like right away you were, you, you knew you wanted to do that or you knew where it could go. When I was a young athlete, I just did track and sports because I liked it. And the things that were on TV, like baseball and football, you could see the end path. But for track and field, I couldn't see it. I mean, I saw the Olympics, but it was so far away. And I remember a coach brought me to, my high school coach brought me to the Prefontaine Classic. And being in the stands around people cheering on these athletes who run, I was like, I had no clue that track could be this. And so getting that exposure from a company or like a business perspective is kind of the same thing. You're like, I don't understand the ins and outs. I don't understand the opportunities. And I don't understand um, how I fit into that. Yeah, it's kind of like starting 
college as a freshman and yeah, someone asked me what's your major exactly be? exactly you're like i don't know economics and then i took one <laughs> cal class and i'm like philosophy <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> da, da. Uh, science. <laughs> and so until you get a little bit yeah. of exposure and you know I, one of the things that i was i started in a couple different ways so yeah. you know having those exploratory conversations and like what i think i wanted yep. but then i i did two things i looked into a lot of rotational programs that's smart um and that's very dependent on the time of year yeah that you know uh, I was retiring into a pandemic, so not an yeah. ideal time. But, yeah. you know, the rotational programs, I think, is very unique in which you go and you you s work four different jobs for yep. a couple months each. And then at the end, it's like, oh, well, that's what I really liked. Right. And then the other thing I thought of, um, and I, I knew then eventually I wanted to be in marketing okay. and partnerships, which is what I'm doing now for American Express. And I, I knew that that was where I wanted to go, but there, that's a very vague yeah, yeah, yeah. title and you know and so um the next thing i did was i googled companies in new york with the best work-life balance oh nice and <laughs> uh, you know maybe that's a little too honest no, but no, it's good i had never worked a job before yeah, that exactly. didn't allow you a two-hour nap and a few hours of netflix exactly and so the idea of immediately going and you know trying to become an investment banker or something <laughs> working 80 hours a week. It, yeah. it just, it seemed like it would have been too harsh of a transition. Yep. And I knew running was still going to be important to me. Right. I, I, you know, my family is growing as well. I have okay. a daughter eight months back home. That's awesome. Yeah. Congrats. Day one showing up here, she crawled for the first time. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So I had to miss that. And and so I also knew that I was going to obviously continue to do Sidious Mag stuff yep. and work with Chris and promote the sport in that way. Right. And so that was two things. It was one saying, you know what, I'm going to continue to stay involved in the sport on this like media side. Yep. And so I don't necessarily need to scratch that itch from a work side of things like i sure. can go and do something completely different and have that work-life balance when i retired i said i wanted running to be a hobby got it and i think the current situation and what we do at the city has definitely allows it to be a hobby yeah but i i work-life balance was really important to me and um you know it, it's allowed me to do this and that's also i think coming to a big company allowed that structure that makes sense and the training and the exposure that we had talked a little bit about well, one question i have for you is when you retired did you struggle with um who you were yeah and the reason i ask this is because i have heard and and witnessed many athletes not know what they were if they weren't an athlete yeah and maybe it was like some of that initial exploratory phase of like, I think I want this, but I don't really know. So I have to find out. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I I say this like as a joke, but it's actually serious. I think I would have been a better athlete had I been less aware of the life that comes after. Less aware. I think I was a little bit too dialed into the fact that like I, I knew it was finite i knew there were other things out there i have my running friends but i also have plenty of friends who mm. have no interest in running whatsoever so you think being more just tunnel visioned i wasn't as tunnel visioned and so i was too prepared for the transition mentally interesting maybe my resume wasn't perfectly yeah, yeah. tailored and ready but i always knew that the day would come mm -hmm. that i would hang up the spikes and become you know a, a citizen yeah yeah absolutely uh, there's still not a very good word for like <laughs> yeah. what are you when you're not a professional athlete anymore um, civilian just a, a mere mortal <laughs> um and so i sometimes wish i i struggled more i think i was too good at the transition mm. because i also was really ready for it the last couple of years i struggled with injuries my performances yeah. weren't what they were supposed to be and so by the end it was like i'm exhausted for and sure and was excited to hang them up um, I definitely look back fondly on my career, yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. but I, I do think that I didn't have as much tunnel vision, especially in those final few years, as maybe would have been beneficial because I was so aware that there was life beyond running. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I, I do think that is a, a thing, especially being here at Worlds with athletes at this level. It's almost taboo to ask what are you going to do after sport? It's like, wait a minute. Wait, whoa, whoa. If they're whoa. not 30, don't ask yet. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> I'm here. I, I met the biggest competition of this year. I meddled, like whatever it is. Um, you know, I'm going to do the same thing next year. So 
it, it makes like we were 100 percent tunnel vision brand and i as well so that totally makes sense so did you did you struggle in that immediate aftermath i mean you you were going out on a much greater high than i was <laughs> yeah. they were kicking me out yeah that's yeah for for us it was our decision to leave and i was aware that there was a few ways that you could stop being a track and field athlete you could get injured um you could become old and not do as well or you could do it on your own and i had seen examples of all of those things but it seemed like a majority did the injury thing um or or just kind of like the fade thing so that contributed to us wanting to um, retire but also personally i actually never identified as just an athlete it was something that i did having 10 disciplines probably yeah that's sure that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but i mean i did sport my whole life it was the only thing i knew but i didn't um i don't know i've always just been the kind of person that's like I'm not necessarily that thing that I'm doing. I've always had other interests. And so for me, I was just ready and it was okay to say, did the things that I tried to do um, as best as I could do them. Maybe there was more there, more left, but um, this for somebody else now. So, you know, having that balance and doing other things and, you know, diversity of events and <laughs> yeah. interests, have you found really applicable skills that maybe people wouldn't have been aware of. And then yeah. all of a sudden you get in the workplace and you see yeah. maybe other people's strengths or weaknesses and your own and how yeah. it lines up. And it's like, well, I can do this really well because I was an elite athlete. Yes, is the short answer. The long answer is, um, and I think this is athletes who try to move on beyond sport, um, I think struggle with what do I know or what am I doing that can contribute to anything that's not sport. Um, what I have found after being out of sport for five years is that what people call soft skills, um, employers love, like it's hard until you see it in action. Though. Yeah, Everyone has a yeah. soft skill. Just, just, <laughs> just being in, in like a part of a team at a big company or even a startup for, for that matter, the things that really matter outside of the technical skill, which is probably 20 to 30% of, um, you know, how you make progress is being able to work in a team, being able to set a goal, <laughs> being able to um, be like disciplined and relentless and it trying to so achieve simple, that thing. Right? Yeah, like, it's so simple. And, and also, uh, because I'm interested in science and engineering, athletes are not that far off from being like thinking like scientists. And the reason I say that is because when you go to practice every day, whether you're running or throwing or jumping, the thing that you do is you say, okay, here's the thing I'm trying to achieve. Um, run this you know, interval at a certain time, uh, throw like 50 throws in the shot and practice this one thing or try to get further in distance. And you go to practice, you, you basically are like, okay, I know my technique. I'm going to try to do this thing to make my performance better. You do it and you look at the results, you get a measurable outcome. And then with that measurable outcome and the feel that you got from your attempt, you think, okay, what adjustment am I going to make? So it's this like hypothesize, test, review, improve. And it's just, you do that so often in practice, like, I don't know, 50 to a hundred times a day, depending on how many attempts you, you make in your event. And that training that you do in your mind f f over 10 years or however long your career is, is, is like insanely analogous to how somebody approaches just improving or finding out something new in the field of science in the field of engineering in startups and companies like all you're trying to do is improve your product or um, improve your team or achieve something that day and like everything an athlete does is totally applied to that and you do it a lot faster and a lot better than most people just by way of your training i think a big thing that i found was it's hard to write all of that on a resume yeah. until it's in action. Yeah. You know, personally, I, I'm in an external facing role. And so constantly, you know, meeting people and having to present to them. Sure. And it wasn't until I was actually in the position that I think, you know, my boss was able to see me do it. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, well, yeah. you know, I've gone, I've, I've had to give interviews in mixed zones under the most stressful exactly. times of my life, I perform under pressure. Yep. I've, I've spoken in front of hundreds of kids at camps. And so yeah. then the idea of like presenting a deck to, one or two people it's not as intimidating you don't yeah. get as nervous it's not that big of a deal because of that but how do i say that without actually doing it yeah. and 
you know, something that I think is really important is having advocates for athletes within the corporate world. For sure. And, you know, we were saying like, you know, I hope that young athletes aren't thinking about the next thing at the very beginning of their career. But as you get into the twilight years in which you're like, you know, maybe one more cycle or I'll go another couple of years. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the time to start thinking about things a little bit. But as we talk about having advocates, the inside, because you need someone to vouch and say, I know this guy or I've worked with athletes before. Yeah. Networking is massive. Yeah. And and that's all it takes is one person yep. getting connected with the right people. And yep. so I do want to bring on Chris O'Donnell um, to join us and help, you know, I guess, steer this conversation into sure. some of the work that you guys are doing. So. For those who aren't familiar with Chris, he was uh, oh, most of the planet. They, you know, <laughs> some of us are very fortunate to already be familiar. Yeah, um, you were at Nike for 32 years. Yes, and yes, now sir. you've you've turned your attention towards what is called the Bell Lap, and it's helping athletes make that transition to what comes next after sport. Yes, absolutely. And uh, yeah, my my life after track has pretty much been my whole life. Uh, so it's been really interesting to hear you guys talk about the transition you made and the, and the obstacles that you've had to overcome or just maybe not obstacles. Well, yeah, no, yeah challenges, obstacles, challenges, right? challenges for sure. Yeah. Because every athlete that I've talked to, I've talked to dozens of athletes <clears throat> over the last you know four or five years, everybody has a story like that. And, and what, what you guys I think are fortunate is that you had somebody take a chance on you without a thick resume, which right. is, which is funny enough. The same thing was true in sport as well. You know, sometimes people take chances on athletes without great performances. Yeah. And uh, so I just thought that was interesting. Yeah. So, so the Bell Lap exists really so that we can reduce the number of athletes that have to rely on somebody taking a chance on them. Right. So you talked about it's tough to put those characteristics that are important to employers, which they absolutely are. And every employer knows that. But there's a lot of blocks in the system that rely on resumes and things that make it tough to get there. So the Bell Lap exists to try and help athletes like, reduce the amount of chances that people have to take on them. It was, uh, it was interesting. When I was applying for jobs, I remember there was one company that it was a, a, a fitness running related brand. You know, like they should have understood what I had done previously. And I was talking to someone from HR initially and it was, you know, you needed to have two years of marketing experience. And I was like, great, I have seven plus, right? <laughs> yeah. you know, like the thing you're trying, yeah, the yeah. thing yeah. you're trying yeah, yeah. to market is like, it lines up perfectly. And the, you know, the, the HR contact was essentially like, you know, unfortunately I don't think this role is going to be for you because you, you don't have any marketing experience and we're looking for two years. And I was like, what are you talking Right. <laughs> so frustrating. Yeah. The, the thing I love about the Bell app and the, this ties into what you're saying. And I think hopefully um, a message to athletes uh, watching is that pro probably one of the largest untapped pools of talent from like a work perspective is the track and field uh, community or just the sport community we're for biased. that matter. <laughs> yeah, we're biased, but, but, but even just, we're even just we're track people. A athletes in general, because I know of several like football or basketball players who probably won't say it publicly, but also struggle with the same transition, the same thing. And uh, so that's, that's one thing. But the second thing is what everybody's watching on TV with these athletes performing, um, they do and will have lives after these sport. And uh, it's just assumed that they're going to be great and, and do great things. I think Allison Felix is like a really good example of somebody who's done good in setting up that future and using her platform and brand to kind of drive forward. But then there's a lot of examples of like the athlete who struggles with kind of no idea and they're maybe not saying or, or getting that help or opportunity. So right. that's the, that's the thing about the bell up. It's bringing those two things together. Yeah. And I, I think one of the things, and I've been really fortunate to work with people like Ashton and, and the other folks on our advisory board to help shape the bell up. One of the things that's, and there's other programs that are out there that are, yeah. are helping athletes, right? Mm -hmm. the, Jack Wickens has got a program called your next success. That's really nice. And, Which is how I was able to. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that, that right. helps. Right. And, and there's the women from Uru sports are, are building a network. There's other people doing it. What's unique about the bell lap is it's trying to address the resume issue. In addition to those other things, by trying to give athletes real time work experience. Mm -hmm. And I can see why nobody's done it before because it's hard. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to get companies to say, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll hire somebody as an intern in the winter. You know, everybody's yeah. got summer intern programs. 
you, you, you would think it would be just click and drag, you know, later six months, but yeah. it makes people's heads spin. Well, sometimes. It, it's, it's also tough for athletes who, you know, are signing autographs, taking pictures, coming out to crowds of thousands, yeah. you know, roaring and cheering their name to then, you know, not everyone's as humble as you and would do the cold email. You know, a lot of these athletes, then it's like, you're going to be the intern. Like you're going to, you're going to do yeah. the coffee runs. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're going to get paid what? Like yeah. how many dollars an hour? Like, yeah. And that, that's a transition in and of itself. You're yeah. the man. And now it's like, all yeah. right, you are yeah. the bottom of the totem pole, but yeah. you haven't been here before. Well, but so I, I would challenge athletes to remember you might, you probably were there, right? Like when you first started in sport, you weren't the best. You had to build and you had to go through those fourth place finishes. You had to go through those injuries and believing that you could do it, but everybody else kind of being like, okay, we saw them do something once, but haven't heard from them again. Um, you know, where have they been? And uh, like an example would be um, Evan in the steeplechase, right? Mm -hmm. he, he had his injury and then he came back and fought for years and everybody's like, where's Evan? And then here he is, you know, getting like that kind of stuff, I think is this, this the same thing, but we, we for, I think if you're at a high level, you forget a little bit like, oh, I used to be, and I had to fight to get back up there. Yeah, and th just seeing that characteristic and like someone like Evan, but in any athlete, yeah. as if I was a hiring manager, right? I would be like, okay, I think that will apply really well. That skill, that soft skill is transferable to anything that I'm doing. And that's the sort of person you'd want on your team. Yeah, without a doubt. And, and I think I, I'm really glad you guys are having this conversation because I know a lot of athletes will hear it. And I think it's something that, that athletes should be thinking about, right? And you, you guys talked about it, that, that sometimes you get the opportunity to think about it as you're progressing in your career and you are approaching that time of retirement. And that's what Andrew Bumble, though, went like, that started the Bell Lap, he called me well before he was going to retire and he was thinking about it. There's other people that injury stops things, Boom. right? And you don't have time to think and it's a harder transition. But I think you guys having the conversation now, I hope more athletes think about it and I hope more companies think about like trying to break down some of those rules yeah. to allow for people either just to move right from their career in sport to the career in business or to open up the door to an internship or project work or part-time work. It's, it's good for everybody. It's, it's win-win. It actually can increase the longevity of an athlete's career because, and maybe you felt this way, how old were you in 2016, 2017? Um, I was 27. Okay, so you had friends who are now- 20, 29. Jeez. <laughs> Engineering, science. You had, <laughs> <laughs> subtraction, hard. Um, so you, you have friends at that point who are starting families, buying houses, getting promoted, and like- you know, being directors of companies and like, they're doing really well. And meanwhile, you're, yeah, it's like, what am I doing? I felt so behind. And even yeah. though, you know, they would trade positions with you in a heartbeat, mm. but you're watching them succeed in a different industry as you are in that position. It would probably be really helpful to kill some of those demons in the back of your head. Yeah. If you just were building your resume a tiny bit, you were For doing sure. something, you're dipping your toes in the water yep. And at no expense to training, you know, doing it in the off season, doing it, working from home and just finding a way to get a little bit of exposure yep. yeah. and maybe then accelerating that process. Then when you do eventually make the decision to hang it up. Yeah. I, th I think the one thing I could have done a lot better uh, is network. And um, that would be two things. One with my fellow athletes did it a little bit, but I should have done it so much more. Just like hanging out. Yeah. I don't know why I was so afraid to do that, but I, I just assumed that everybody else had their own training thing. And like, let's not, you know, let's, let's keep it at arm's length. Um, which absolutely life's too short for that kind of stuff. Uh, and the second thing is network with companies or people doing things that I thought were interesting. Um, I always get the question because I was successful. It's like, do you think you could have spared time to like go do other stuff and still has been as successful? I don't, maybe, I don't know. I, my, my answer is I don't think so. Um, With 10 events going on, I can't yeah. imagine. <laughs> I probably yeah. could have. But, but <laughs> not, not even the events, because I know how training is. Like, I know what sport is. You, you train, and then you're done at, like, one. And then you do physio, da, da, da. And then you're done at, like, three or four. And you have all this time, and then you're in the off season. And what I spent doing, or what I spent that, my time doing, same as you. It's like, okay, video games or movies or, like, resting for the next day. But it is important aspect. It's 100%. not, it, it, yeah. it's, that's not coming from a point of laziness. And no. like, I just want to, no, it's a but necessary part of training. I often think I, what I should have been doing is 
studying the engineering stuff that I already thought was interesting. Yeah, take like, a class, one class or something. Could have done that. So, uh, yeah. And, and I think that's, again, that's, a, I think, a great service that you guys are providing, right, to other athletes right now is to, is to get people to hopefully think differently. And that's why we, that's why we named the program the Bell Lap. Yeah. We're, we're trying to capture people while they're still. Before they're done. Yeah. Right. While they're still competing to make that time mm -hmm. to invest in their future now. And, and then, then the transition hopefully becomes a lot easier. Yeah. The, the thing that I just thought of that I think would be super helpful for athletes is you actually, what I've realized is you don't have to change your mindset at all. Like what you have done to achieve things in sport and become an elite athlete is exactly the same thing that you need to do to achieve anything in life. <laughs> so deciding what that is, is really the hard part. Um, but to your point, it's kind of like, you don't know until you just go. So if you have all these things you're interested in, just choose one and go, and then it'll kind of, you have to, um, I think trust in that process, but yeah, the, the same methods you use to achieve stuff. So that, that determination, the kind of like finding a way to make it work, um, coming back day after day. I mean, athletes are insanely good at getting better flat out. Like that's right. the simplest thing. And so just do the thing and like use the same mindset and processes to get better. It's amazing how much more mental bandwidth I have every day now than yeah, I did when I was true. competing as well. It's like, now that I've been able to re like shift my energy in a different direction and I don't need as much sleep anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That has been super helpful. Yeah. The whole five hour sleep thing. I'm like, this is kind of awesome. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, you know, you used to like, really, I got to sleep. It's, yeah, it's, it's true. true. And now, especially with kids, it's, you know, those yeah. days are done, but you know, I think it, it just opens up and you, you can just redirect that into a whole new path. And I just, I want to be able to communicate that as best as possible For to sure. the people in the position to make a difference. I, I do think that we lose a lot of really good athletes immediately after college because True. there's no clear path, as you were saying, after you're done competing. It's like, yes, you hope to make an Olympic team. Yep. But for a lot of collegiate athletes who might have that potential, that still might be four or five plus years away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, especially when you look at some of the money that is available for athletes in the sport, you're just thinking, why would I give up five years of a career in which I would make a real living yeah. and at the end of it be in a much better position to take a risk on myself? Mm -hmm. And so I do think it all ties into just the, the greater participation of elite athletes for longer and just more plentiful. Absolutely. Totally agree. You know, we, we had the pleasure of working with Aaron Mallett, 110 meter hurdler. Uh, in our pilot uh, this year, and, and he he was reflecting on a lot of what you guys just said, like the, the work that he did uh, for a consulting company, for John, John Burns Real Estate Consulting, helped him make money. He, he's not a paid uh, athlete, yep. but so it helped him make money. But it was the first time he'd been able to do that off his feet, right? You know, which helped him in his training. And and there's so much, and, and he bought in, right? So he had to buy in, and I think that's what you guys are talking about a lot, right? Is you have to, you have to buy into this thing and you have to commit like you have to commit to your sport. It might only be a slice of your time as an athlete, whether it's, you know, like the last couple of years of your career or a, f a few months in the winter time yep. where you're carving that time away, but, but making that commitment, it pays off, right? Have you spoken to other athletes? Oh, yeah. About, you know, I guess I'm sure your Instagram DMs are, are full of Instagram. lots of, okay. I, I'm sure your yes. email, is, or <laughs> however people can find a way to get in touch, is filled with plenty of training questions. But do you get yeah. athletes even today who are asking questions or, you know, the guys that you used to compete against? Yeah, I mean, I, I won't say their names, but there was a couple athletes who I was um, meeting with uh, just by chance recently. And um, they were like, man, what do you do after sport? And so I know it's on people's minds. In fact, when we lived in San Francisco, um, we gathered an entire group of like former Olympians um, and actually ex-military people together because we were talking with these folks and they're all struggling with how to like move on past sport. And for some re people, it was like 10 years since they had not been an Olympian or, or had the got, highest of highs. Yeah, I'm gotten sure, their last, like... last medal. And um, I was like, holy smokes, this is like a serious thing for a lot of folks. Um, and so, yeah, short, short answer is, yeah, I've talked to a lot of athletes and it's, it is something that's important to them and on their mind. Um, and so I think the stuff that the Bell app, Chris and the crew there are doing, um, and these other places are, is, is really good. So you should definitely reach out if you're thinking about this and you're watching and listening. Um, because 
there is and should be life after sport, you have a lot more to give the world than um, your athletic performances, which uh, you, you can just use that same mindset to, to do your next thing. And you don't have to know what it is right now. Chris, where if people are interested, if there's an athlete involved or maybe there's, you know, a small company, a big company, someone listening, what can they do if they're if this is an interesting enough conversation that they want to get? Well, involved? yes. And that's, well, for both athletes and for for businesses, we, we've got a website up and running now. It's the bell dot com. Two L's because uh, the other one was taken and nobody types in three of anything. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, you can hit hit the website. It, it tells you more about the program. You can apply as an athlete. You can apply to be our, our in our kind of uh, cohort uh, that we're, we're uh, going to bring into the program this year. We're going to working with 10 athletes. We want to make sure it's successful. And I had no involvement on the 10 thing. <laughs> <laughs> Although I do like the number. <laughs> Just a nice I think, it's a, number. I think it's a good number. <laughs> a little homage to one <laughs> yeah. of the advisory board members, perhaps. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, and I would encourage athletes to, if, to at least think about this, even if you're not interested in the Bell Lab or, or, or your next success, whatever it is, put it in your mind, get, get thinking about this stuff. And any company out there, big or small, like you're missing an opportunity. You, you talked about it. Like the largest, I believe the largest uh, untapped potential are, are former athletes, uh, talent pool out there. And, and the, I love track and field. Oh, I love track and field. I love track and field. Um, love track and yeah, field. we like it. So, <laughs> but but I, I love track and field from a business perspective. As a, as a former uh, hiring manager, if you will, like the, the wild diversity of this sport, I mean, across every place, every measure, like the mindset of a decathlete is different than the mindset of a miler, right? So however you measure diversity, check. Yeah. So I love this sport because of, of that talent pool. Um, yeah, it's just amazing. So before we sign off, one final question for you, Ash, and completely pivoting. Oh, yes. If we went over to Hayward right oh now. Oh, my God. <laughs> I knew it. Which of the 10 disciplines would you, you score, the most ask it, I was. score the most points? That, I don't, I don't want to know the overall score. Oh Just gosh. which one event would you be the best at if we went over to Hayward right now? Oh, man. You know, I, I did this um, YouTube thing with Nick Simmons where he did a decathlon. <laughs> and I was like, I don't even know if I could do some of that stuff. <laughs> um, Obviously, sprints and jumps are worth the most. Couldn't high jump, couldn't pull vaults very well. Uh, probably long jump. You could long jump something decent still. Uh, probably still throw down a good one? Enough to be, I wouldn't say respectable, but not embarrassed. I have no concept of what number that is. <laughs> uh, dis, dis, distance wise, I mean, I would get over seven meters. Nice. But I'd pull a, I'd pull a hammy, probably. <laughs> one attempt, one and done. You know what? So I, I live like a block from a track. And uh, obviously, I was getting jacked up because the world's. I was like, all right, I'm going to go burn a four. No warm up, really. It's like, okay. That, that, that thought has never what entered my it? mind. Let's see how bad it is. What was it? <laughs> it was horrible. It was, the, the thing is, the time, I think it was like 65, 70 seconds. The thing is, I was, I was, I was running. My body is so unable to produce the performance that I like wasn't, my, my lungs weren't tired. <laughs> I was just at a constant speed and I couldn't go any faster. And I was like, this sucks. Did you still look good? Probably. I don't but know I mean, if you can long jump seven meters. Yeah, you're <laughs> right. You're right. It's only, it's only like 70 feet though. But I'm thinking like, I'm on the, I'm on the back stretch. I think I can't go any faster. But I'm, it's just like my legs just don't move oh, man. like they used to. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's good. How often are you on like a, a meeting at work or something? Oh and gosh. someone maybe recognizes the name or it comes up or someone who you maybe have been working with for a few months Lots. was like, I just found out. Lots. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, like, ah, enough of that. Yeah. <laughs> or, from the, from, yeah, the company perspective, the, that thing, those types of things happened quite a bit early on. Um, and then when we meet in person, it's always like, wow, you're a lot smaller than I thought you were. It's <laughs> like, so I get used to get that a lot and still do. Um, but yeah, so it's, a thing that continues to happen, yeah. um, which, you know, it's cool. It's I won the corporate challenge in New York, um, like oh. in Central Park, the road race. Yes. And, and then did you get a lot of after I got that? Like, a lot of people. Were you a professional well, runner? No. A lot of people, yeah, slacked. I, I was, let's just say I was giving out a lot of running advice. Yeah, I bet you. It's like, hey, yeah. how do I, what's my, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, hey, I'm super excited for the world's, this is kind of like the dream come true being an Oregonian, obviously university of Oregon. Um, 
so excited about what you guys are doing here. Yeah, you can look in the camera and say anything positive about City, City of Smack, Smack that you want. Um, <laughs> just elevating the sport. So excited about uh, this crew and everybody who's watching. Thanks for supporting our sport and continually being interested. Um, the competition so far has just been unreal. More than I could have expected. I know there are a lot of questions coming to Eugene by everyone. Athletes, sponsors, um, organizing committees. So hopefully those have been and continue to be answered in a positive way. Um, but overall, just the human performance and the motion, it's just great. We didn't realize how big of a Sidious follower you were until recently. Well, I mean, this was, um, what am I, 34? Like, I did track until I was 30, right? And this is like a gigantic portion of my life. And uh, for all the reasons we talk about, I just the sport is great. And I love keeping track of it. And I think it is important what you guys are doing because... I started in 2010 and then in 2012, it was like social media just started being a thing, just started getting applied to contracts like, oh, would you please tweet 10 times? Oh, cool. So it was like a thing that became important. And now it's obviously clear that um, athletes have stories and brands and are very interesting outside of sport. And so the more that you guys are capturing that here and trying to tell that and just bring people into the conversation stuff, I think it's good. Thank you. That means Hashtag a lot. good for sport. Yeah, yeah, good for the sport. Uh, well, thanks so much for everyone for joining us. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Ashton. This yeah. is a great conversation. Something I personally was really looking forward to doing all week. So nice. glad we could do it. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, thanks, guys. Thanks. All right. And now we're back with another live guest in the City of Smag backyard. It's just like you never know who's going to show up sometimes. Uh, who's who? Yeah. This flag is, I mean, we're, we're, gonna run we're out raising of space so much money for charity right here. <laughs> and we'll auction this off at yeah. the end. Um, <laughs> we are joined now by 1500 meter world championship finalist, Corey McGee. And Corey, you, you might, I'm going to need your help introducing who the other guest is because Coach Usri here, I've only heard stories and you said that you've got to get the two of you guys on together. <laughs> Um, so Usri started coaching me way back in 2005 and he coached me all through middle school and high school and even helped me a little bit here and there when I was in college um, and kind of has been my mentor in the sport since I was a kid so really happy to have him here with us. Usri, what's it like being at a world championship to watch Corey? Wow. Just wow. Uh, I was just chills goosebumps <laughs> so we were living just the story of her being a 12 year old and she wanted to be in this position through her career is just i'm a fan so. <laughs> <laughs> well not many uh, you know young athletes who are 12 years old dream of one day competing at the highest level right that's like a relatively rare athlete that you had on your hands yeah absolutely i mean since day one she thought i was a monster because <laughs> six three and she was <laughs> you know a little girl but yeah i mean since the first summer i worked with her just in her eyes she had a a vision and yeah you're right you know they don't dream most of them i coached um you know they wanted to be good in high school or maybe college but corey she had that dream She's living it now, so yeah. How nervous do you get before her races? Uh, I don't. Her dad does. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually took a video. I will send it to you. I was just chill in the final, in the semifinal. But, you know, because there's nothing you can control. You know, the old saying, say the athletes don't get nervous, but, uh, but fans and, and the coaches do. But I was, I, you know, she's in the final. Or even throughout races, yeah, you, you know, you, you enjoy it. Mm -hmm. There's nothing you can do, um, but her dad, man, her dad, he's... <laughs> <laughs> does he go to the back, or does he stay out and, like, cover his eyes? What does it look like? So I was with him throughout the rounds, and we were just sitting. No, 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 he, he watches every minute, yeah. every second, follow her, and just um, just kind of cheer. For me, I just enjoy, because I want to see the moments from each hundred happening. Yeah. Is, is that true that athletes don't get too nervous? How... It, uh, like, I would, I would what's the nerve level through the rounds, I, I guess? The rounds are more nerve wracking. The, the rounds are definitely where if I have any nervous energy, it's probably, yeah, like the semifinal was where I was feeling like a little bit edgy because at that point, like there's the, there's like something on the line in the sense of like, if I don't make the final, I'm going to walk away really disappointed. And um, then once that's behind you and you like know that you didn't, I guess, just drop the ball and you're in the final, you're finally able to just be like, okay, I'm here with the world's best and I can like 
put it all out there. And anyway, so there's definitely nerves on the rounds. Same with USA's, like very nerve wracking. The dichotomy of the conversations we had in the mix zone after the first and the second yeah. round was so interesting because the first round, you probably didn't feel as good as you were trying to convince yourself mm -hmm. you did afterwards. Yeah. And like, I could tell that you were you were you were shoving that down that feeling totally. you're like I made it through yeah. and then the next day you finally were like okay I, yesterday yeah. didn't feel very good <laughs> now that I'm in the final like we can relax a yeah, little bit. Yeah that was definitely um, you know it's it's not even like at that point it wasn't even like a conscious like coherent thought I was just like cross the finish line immediately bury the fact that it didn't feel awesome and then like think about the next day and I was like also kind of doing that thing where you're telling yourself you're like yeah I mean I like, you know, just probably shook off all the whatever that weird feeling was and like that lactic in my legs, like There's now no it happened and it won't happen backing. tomorrow. Yeah. And so yeah, you're just like telling yourself these weird, like definitely incorrect, sort of like strange lying to yourself, like whatever. So I was doing a little bit of that after the first round and I think mostly like, um, there is something to be said though about like with the 1500 and the way that USA's is like, feeling better each round. I feel like that's such a huge advantage that we have coming off of USA's coming into Worlds because I did feel like a little better with each round at USA's. So I was like, oh, just like recreate that here. So we do have that small advantage. <laughs> you made it through the rounds into the, into the final. Like, so it was a weird race. I mean, right from the gun, you know, there's three people who just decide to go off and, and, and take it. It left a chase pack that you found yourself at the front end of it. Is that we where you wanted to be? <laughs> we, no. When you were drawing up the race in your mind beforehand? Is that <laughs> That was not how it was. In, I had thought of a lot of possibilities, but I had not imagined that. Yeah, we, we sat in the stands and he pointed it out and he was like, that's not where Corey wants to be right now. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, so at that point, like... Is, do, do, do you let your thoughts go to like, now it's a battle for fourth, fifth, or is it like... I can still, you know, do my best to reel them in or someone might, you know, come back to me. What are you thinking of that? Well, it's complicated. Definitely the first thing where I was like, at no point was I thinking I'm racing for fourth or fifth right now. Like that, I feel like I would, like that just isn't the way yeah. that my mind works in that moment. I saw the three women up front. Actually, I think it was four at that point. And one of the women kind of was coming back to me. So it was more of that other thing you said where mm -hmm. you like, kind of think okay also with the clock being broken i was like yeah the 55 they definitely didn't go out in 55 is that what you thought well so i knew they didn't but i was because i was leading the chase pack i was looking at the clock yeah and so i was like what the hell like what is the time right now <laughs> and like that alone was like kind of an interrupting thought where usually i would just be like okay cool like 61 like we're good like i've done that before instead i saw 55 and i was like did they go through in 55? And then I was like, the clock's broken. And I knew the clock was messed up mid race, which is also kind of like not yeah. a good thought. Like it's, it was, yeah. Like that was kind of a little bit of noise that I don't want to have in my head during the race. And then I think I was like 450 meters in and I, I knew that I was okay at that point, but I also, um, was I was aware of the fact that like I didn't love the position I was in and I but then I was kind of hopeful if they had gone out in like 55 that maybe they were going to die. Yeah. <laughs> so it was just a weird like wait I don't actually know what's going on up front at all. Um and then I guess mid race someone kind of started to die and so then that kind of like you taste blood a little bit and you're like wait a second like we're in this thing and even though we weren't but i felt like maybe we were yeah. <laughs> so it was just yeah like you said a weird race i definitely knew that like in my mind going into it there were a few women who i had like kind of like tagged in my brain of like keep an eye on them and one of them was laura because just like the way that obviously like she's coming off of like meddling last year but i definitely like believed that i could like compete with laura yesterday and then she was far gone by the time I got to the front of that pack and it was just like yeah a lot of the concrete things that I thought were going to happen like just played out so differently I first off would you trust a clock like that that was a few seconds off to get 0 0.001 seconds correct on a reaction time I, I digress oh. um, <laughs> um have you ever 
been in that situation before, a race that goes out in 58. Someone next to us was like, Kyle, what do you think? 58? And I was like, I, damn, I wish I was in this race. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I can think of like two times in my life when I was like in a race that went out way too fast. One is the Dream Mile, my senior year. I went out in 60 seconds. <laughs> no. Ajay Wilson and I went out in 60, maybe 61. She was wearing a sprinting spike. We she thought it was an 800. And we were trying to run 440 in the mile. So <laughs> just. Think well, at that, that point, you don't have to work that much harder. You just close like 340, you're good. <laughs> yeah, so we got second to last and last in that race. <laughs> it was really a fun time for us. And then um, actually in 2013, I went out in 61 when I got the standard for um, in the Houston. world team. Yeah, so I definitely have been in races where, but again, 61 versus 58, that's a very different, that's yeah. a very different experience. Yeah. Did you always see the signs of of her just being the one to just like go out there and like I think what Joe now only allows you like one one time to full send a race? Yeah. And did did she used to do that in high school? Just go out really hard and try to hang on? Yeah, as a kid, that's what she did. <laughs> and there's a quick story. It's a fun story. So I was coaching another girl, and she went to run district in Mississippi, and I didn't know Corey, but the girl. Uh, I was cheating for her on the phone. Her dad was with her. It wasn't an important meet, but I just qualified to get to the state meet. And then uh, her name was Amy, and I'm cheating for Amy. So her dad was telling me on the phone, okay, they took off. All right, so this girl is took off. She went, up, she went ahead of him. I was like, she's going to die. She'll come back. <laughs> but I didn't know who Corey was. <laughs> then first lap, second lap. I was like, she gone. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, and she ended up running. You know, that was her style as a kid, always front. Um, the next big one was the high school meet when she was a uh, eighth grader mm -hmm. at the National High School Championship. She did and the same I thing. See. She she was in the front with high school kids, but then with the 800 meter to go, she's looking at us in the stand. Should, should I go? Should I? Go? <laughs> like you feel good, go. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, she was a front runner. Well, I guess there's a, a very specific point in that race where you kind of have to make a decision, right? And it's really early on. Yeah. Is there a part of you that thought, I should just go and see if I can hang on for dear life? Yeah, actually, it was probably like less than 300 meters in. I, we were on a turn, so I don't even know exactly where it was in the race, but like they weren't that far ahead yet. And I, I kind of felt myself like start to try to close the gap. And then I was like, that's just not the right Probably move here. Well. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I actually did control myself a little bit. Um, but then that's when I had already passed someone and went from like, I guess that was kind of the difference maker. If I had sat in that second position of the, of the chase pack, that was where I, I did make a mistake there. And I look back and I'm like, shoot, I should have just been a tiny bit more patient in that moment. Um, but I I guess I didn't realize like that it had already kind of been like blown open. And cause I, I came from probably like seventh or eighth, passed a few people to get to the front of the second pack and then got up there, was like, oh shit, we already lost the top three, went to get up there and then I was like, they're gone and it just all happened really like fast so um yeah then I was leading and it was a little weird and then I was like should I like throw on the brakes and make this girl pass me back and I felt good so I don't know the 1500 like it's you have enough time to sort of like play this game but like you don't you can't make you can make like one mistake and maybe get away with it but like I don't know yeah <laughs> in a race like this, I mean, I'm used to getting dropped on runs and uh, Come being to our morning runs at 830 and I'm <laughs> dropped. I'm used to being by myself in, in that sense. But th with this, like that chase pack, this might sound like a dumb question because I've never been on a stage like that. What are the sounds that are taking place in that chase bag? Is it just like heavy breathing? Is there someone that's cursing and be like, crap, like I let them go? Like what? what is going on in that more chase so bag? More so than the sounds, also describe to Chris why that's more difficult than yeah. maybe leading a race or sitting behind Being someone. Being in the second pack. Yeah, like it's yeah. it's a little different, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it was definitely like demoralizing, I would say. Like it's not fun to like see the top three women at a world championship just like pulling away in the first lap like that is not what we're here for. We're not, I mean, at least I know that's not what I'm here for. So like, I would say hours before the race, there's like a shift where you're like, oh, this is gonna be hard. And then like something clicks and suddenly you're like, I'm, I'm gonna 
fucking go as hard as I can. Like I'm gonna put everything into this thing. And so then the race is happening and you're like, I gotta get up there. Like I can't just sit back here and like accept this. So um, yeah, like you're, you're in it and you don't wanna just be in like this chase pack that's not really like yeah. in the hunt for anything. So that wasn't, that wasn't like fun. And it was definitely a little stressful. Um, in terms of noises, I would say there's enough, like in those moments, there's enough going on in my own head you to the point where hear. I don't even know what's going on. Like I was very much um, trying to be calm and I felt really good going into like 600 to go and kind of like chipping away like 800, 600 to go. I was having like a lot of positive thoughts, but then uh, at some point it was like, I knew we weren't gonna catch them. Then I'm aware of the fact that I'm essentially like pacing the second group. So kind of, yeah. <laughs> Coach, so Corey's obviously very nice and friendly, right? Like we like Corey, when, <laughs> but she can be a killer, right? Like an hour before the race, all of a sudden like her eyes roll the back of her head, things <laughs> like all of a sudden like, <laughs> <laughs> Did you see that when she was younger? Is that why you knew she would be at this level one day? Absolutely, yeah. I've seen that. Her dad has it. All of her family <laughs> her dad has dad definitely it. has <laughs> it. So, yes, yeah, it's a thing. As a kid, she had it. It's just that focus. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And you can see it. It didn't surprise me because every race she does, it's like that. Yeah. When yeah. are we allowed to say, like, the last joke to you before a race? Like, once you go no, for a warm-up, there's, okay, no, that's like we're allowed to joke with I'm you? I'm very grateful for our team dynamic because, like, I'll be sitting there waiting for, like, Joe and Nick to roll up, and I'm, like, in this state of mind that's, like, pretty dark. <laughs> and then suddenly, like, my coaches show up, and I'm like, oh, thank God you're here because i got to get out of my head for, like, if another... we leave you alone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I need, like, probably, once I'm down in the call room, like, final call room, I should be by myself because I get very, like, really dialed in. But I would say, like, if I get there a little too soon, it can be um, maybe, like, like a waste of energy. So, yeah, it's nice to, like, that's always one of the things, like, usury is very funny and lighthearted and kind of helped me relax as a kid. And, like, now I have a team that's, like, a lot of people who are kind of help me chill out a little bit. <laughs> So Mac and I yesterday <laughs> when we were watching one of the races and I won't say what race, I won't say what athlete, but I saw someone just, you know, before the race, I was like, Ooh, they are too tense right now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I, I don't know, like, I don't think they're going to do as well as they think because yeah. you can see the body language yeah, yeah. and I guess, you know, is that a purposeful thing where you're con like, how do you find a way to stay relaxed? Have you ever worked with like sports psychologists? Is there's music involved? Like how did, and yeah. on the biggest stage, when you walk out to people screaming your name and like all the lights are shining on mm -hmm. you, how do you? We talked about this on the podcast we did together and she actually dives into her playlist. I'm actually curious how you expand. <laughs> no, yeah. That. I mean, definitely music. I think having the right people around, um, just like familiarity, of course, like I'm around, my team at practice every day and so they know me well enough to kind of like I, f I think like kind of have a pulse on like when I'm a little bit more stressed or like um being hard on myself and know how to lighten the mood so and then just like practice with anything so obviously like however many races I've run this season I figure it out a little bit more and like you learn what works at USA's and then you just try to like replicate it in a way so there's obviously like um but I kind of talked to Chris about this like at some point I've learned there's a certain feeling that like I want to have as I'm you know about to start my warm up and then like after I finish my jog and then as I put my spikes on and like you achieve that in different ways it's not the same thing every time because obviously sometimes it's a semi so you're a little more stressed or like there's just a variety of things so it's just trying to figure out like the balance of do I listen to this song right now? Or do I like make a joke with Joe right now? Or there's just like a variety of different things that like you just have to kind of um, know like that's the right feeling and like I'm gonna be open to that instead. Uh, and also it helps like I'm in the Team USA tent. It's like half Florida Gators and <laughs> half team boss. So I'm like, I feel right at home right now. <laughs> There's a lot of familiarity now yeah. too. Like, yeah. you know, you, you've made a number of us teams now and it's like, even just seeing that it's like, Oh, like Susan, like mm -hmm. Wallace is there, you know, yeah. Josh is there. Like yeah. it's all the same cast of characters for over a decade. Totally. And like yeah. that, that, starts to be a little bit more comfortable than the first time you ever had done it. Absolutely. Yeah. That helps a lot.
And like everyone there has done this, you know, for so long. And so they also kind of have a, a good idea of what we need. So, yeah. I, I'm kind of curious to see if you can help us get a little bit more excited about that final because we were trying to process it <laughs> and we were talking we about this on our takes. podcast and we were just like, well, Faith won again. And like, she's obviously so dominant considered by many the greatest of all time in the event and so that that was just kind of it can you like as a fellow competitor like where is sort of like the respect that you have for her or just mm -hmm. like the admiration like with you having seen her multiple times now yeah i mean it's very inspiring of course and like of course how long her career is is kind of one of those things where like admittedly i have moments where i'm like huh like how much longer am I going to line up for the 1500? But then you think about faith and it's like, well, pretty long. <laughs> she's been, she's doing this still. So it's, it's obviously inspiring. But then I, for me, I would say the thing that inspires me more is Laura Muir because like she took a crack at it time and time and time and time again. And it got to the point where it was like, and Laura's of course younger, but it, it was like trial and error for a few years there. And so I think like, if there's something I'm excited about, it's more just being like, no, Laura put her nose in it. And like now she's cracked the code and now she's won a couple medals. And like I think that maybe two years ago, a couple people had kind of like doubted if that was going to happen for her. So, um, I mean, of course, utmost respect for Faith. But like I just I get excited thinking about like Laura's trajectory and like the way that she's done things. And anyway, what are they <laughs> like in the call room? Uh, actually, kind of chatty. I would say Faith is very friendly and like um, just seems like. Not that nervous. <laughs> He's like, wait till I show yeah. them. Um, <laughs> if I could run 352, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. The often like the there were three Ethiopians in my race, and they were actually talking. And now, um, in hindsight, I'm like, yeah, they were coming up with this like diabolical plan, and I like unfortunately didn't understand what they were saying. Yeah. But um, yeah, so there was some chatting. I would say like uh, everyone, everyone's like kind of similar energy, like just tiny bit nervous but for the most part i think like kind of how you said like we we do all know each other it's familiar faces so there is like some friendly chatter so do you warm up with anyone i do not no i've just been hitting the cemetery day yeah. after day <laughs> that, that's would be one of the more interesting and if someone is in eugene and not going to like the the stadium tonight just hang out around yeah, the, the, I know. The, the the cemetery outside because that's where everyone warms up totally i actually when i was doing one of my warm-ups i was kind of thinking to myself like it's funny that there aren't more people like kind of scoping it out over here but placing it's bets different. after yeah. it's like oh Corey <laughs> looked, looked okay good. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but team usa i would say at usa is way more people like all of the distance runners are warming up there um for worlds it's been very sparse like i think actually for my final i was the only person warming up that's there. a top that's home field advantage yeah nobody knows so. um <laughs> is <laughs> would you i at this point everyone kind of has a different perspective but you've been around for a while now mm -hmm. and that's more of a testament to the fact that you're making teams in college than your age are you like where are you at being friends with your competitors and you know Look, I wasn't your competitor, but we hung out. Yeah. But with within your event group, are you like happy to chat and get to know everyone? Or are you like, no, no. When I'm stepping on the line, I have no friends. No, I'm. I really enjoy a lot of the women that I race against, and I think it's funny now because like I was kind of having this conversation with um, someone pretty recently, but like I feel I think it was one of the USATF trainers, but like I feel like I, I am the vet right now in the women's 1500. But like, it's not to be confused with Laura Muir. Well, no, yeah. Who's but a veterinarian? It's, <laughs> <laughs> no, in, for the U.S., wow. it's funny because... Stupid joke, sorry. <laughs> like, I, I'm 30 years old. It's pretty common for there to be 30-year-olds in the 1500. But right now, I'm, like, the only person from my, my class, my, like, time in college. Like, I feel like it's kind of not how I imagine things playing out. Like there's a lot of women who have raced over the years and in some way or another, like they're just not on the starting line with me right now. So I'm running against girls who are a few years younger than me. Um, like for instance, Sinclair, like I was thrilled when I watched her win NCAAs years ago and like remember going up to her at a meet in LA and like introducing myself and talking to her about her NCAA race. And like now we're on the team together and we were like laughing about that the other night after the race. But it's just funny cause like I kind of felt this like not little sister, but like I was like excited for her in a like 
it's so good to see the younger kids like doing having this like exciting race at NCAAs and then it's not that many years later and we're she's on in Florida like she's from Florida yeah, you she, are the Florida like... Gator <laughs> at the point you know like she she yeah. won't tell you she had a poster of you in her room no. like definitely <laughs> <laughs> no but it's just funny because like I I've like cheered hard for these girls like I paced Ellie when she was in college in like a 3k at BU and then like it wasn't long after when she was like running for New Balance and now like you know we've obviously been on teams together but it's just funny because I feel like the the older person even though I don't know it's just somehow like I don't have a lot of like my peers with me right now I feel like I'm like the, just it only gets worse just yeah to, uh, I just to feel a little way. bit disconnected <laughs> in a way but it almost feels like it's like this weird process of elimination somehow it's not like I've aged out there's just like the women who I raced in college in my like first few years as a pro, just, I don't know where they went. Like, where are you guys? <laughs> Yushri, is it, can you describe sort of like what that sort of feeling of investment you have sort of like in a race and, and in someone's career, basically, like you probably get so much more excited for, you know, when they announce like the world championships are going to be in like Budapest or Tokyo. Cause you're like, all right, Corey, we got to keep this thing going until then because I want to go out there. So what, what's that like for you sort of like to be in, so invested in someone else's career as a friend, as a mentor, as a former coach? For sure, yeah. Like it's, uh, you know, last year we couldn't go anywhere. So yeah. her dad and I would joke around, this is our Olympics. <laughs> you yeah. Know, being in the U.S. So um, last, a month and a half ago, I was in Morocco with uh, my wife. I went to the Rabat uh, Diamond League. So I sent her a picture. <laughs> of the women's 15. She's like, what? She's like, well, I'll be in Rome. Are you coming? <laughs> we were supposed to go to Venice. So my wife, we're going to Rome. <laughs> so yeah, just easy. It comes easy just to enjoy if we can just, you know, to see her for the next, you know, like you, like you said, Budapest next year. We'll be there. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's emotional. It's proud, pride. Uh, it's everything. Uh, that you see somebody you worked with as a as a kid, and then you go up to do all these great things and go all these places. So we want to be there. We would love to have been in the uh, in last year in Tokyo, but it didn't work out, so we're here. Obviously, Corey has a really strong support system, and Joe is a fantastic coach, and Nick is as well. But what are you? like the voice of reason like what does she come into you for before the race when she needs some advice no we don't talk much like that <laughs> anymore but it's just like just i think you know it was a big smile in rome because she saw you know i sent her a license plate of rome i didn't tell her we're gonna be there because i didn't actually <laughs> said i told my Very wife we're going standard usury <laughs> so but i sent we landed in rome and i sent a license plate and he says for 30. It has nothing to do with the mile but she's like oh good mile time <laughs> <laughs> so i said take a close look and then he says you know italy are you here so yeah <laughs> just that just the just the when you do stuff like that you know it doesn't need to be any advice or anything it's just you know like she'll call and um oh well i'm coming there that's yeah. it is it a reminder of where you've come from at points? Like you, you're now, you're in it. You're on the stage that you dreamed of. And sometimes you probably need to take those moments of like taking a deep breath and like looking around and be like, wow, I yeah. look where I started and now look where I am. Yeah, it's definitely, I think having you three around still and like he lives around the corner in Colorado. He's in Fort oh, Collins. Really? So like yeah. he's just up the road from me. So I get to see him, you know, when I'm in Boulder and whatnot. But there is like this, for me as a kid, um, I liked running and I didn't have a ton of friends that had any idea what I was interested I in. So you didn't have any friends. I didn't have like. any friends at all. And then U3 <laughs> shows up when I was like, you know, whatever, pretty young and like starts talking to me about professional track and field. And I was like, cool. Okay. Like uh, sign me up. And so for me, it was like now at this level, U3 was the only person for many years who like, I could talk to about my goals. And like, we even would have conversations, like when I was, you know, in high school, I would say, hey, Ustri, like what percentage of a pro runner am I right now? Like in my lifestyle, my day to day. And he would be like, maybe, and like, I thought he was gonna say like 80%. And he was like, probably 15%. <laughs> really? Like Are you, you <laughs> like you run most days. And I was just like, what? It like blew my mind. Cause I was like, I have a long way to go. But there's just like that, that history there of like, he, I mean, he like just mentored me, you know, like more than coached me. He 
he helped me like mm-hmm. understand what it was going to take. And so now as a pro, it's just like to have that person still with you that kind of um, opened, like he opened my eyes to like the next level. So that's where it gets really what, special. What exactly <laughs> is your background in the sport? Like previous to coaching Corey and are you Moroccan? Uh, from Morocco. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think Al Bakali? Uh, you did great. Yeah. We were with him yesterday. Yeah, it was fantastic. Yeah. yeah Gotta wow. get him to the backyard. Yeah. Yeah. What a, can you get what him a, here? What yeah. a race. Yeah, we can. <laughs> but it's all about Corey now. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I guess, you know, previous to coaching Corey, like, yeah, where did track. all of your knowledge come from that yeah, obviously I mean, worked? Yeah, from Morocco, rent track in Morocco, in the U.S. I rent for Southern Miss. My wife is an athlete. She was in the Olympics as well. Uh, an 800 from Bosnia. And, you know, like just living in Mississippi, my training partner's, uh, Khalid Kanuchi. So we he opened the running, my hometown. running <laughs> store. He hang with the Kanuchis in Ustery all the so time. So we're best friends for so many years. We opened the running store, and Cody was one of those people that came in, and we, you know, like evaluated her. And so, um, yeah, it's all my life. So track and field, you know, we lived it. You know. um, so Cody came in on the right hand at the right time. Yeah. When she was a kid. So, you know, obviously, he's not Oregon. It's Mississippi, so track is not big. So when you found someone like her, you know, just running. I mean, she was running fast before I met her. How many state t- titles did we get? I don't know, over 200. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You so, should, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, no. no. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, what is the most emotional you've gotten for one of Corey's races? Man, that's a good one. I think last year. The trials? Yeah, uh, halfway, no, in... Uh, in the uh, Olympic uh, mm. semifinal. Yeah. Because I, I really... Same. I knew, <laughs> I knew she would make the final, but I didn't know the results would be at the end if they're going to move her or not, but I knew she was fit. Because, you know, I mean, she's running 408 after going down. Yeah. And that's yeah, a testament of, like, that's, yeah. you know, that 400 probably, you know, making, but, or, uh, that was, that was tough. Can we ask the fun stuff? Yeah. What'd definitely. you do after the race? After the race, what did I do? Um, I celebrated with my New Balance people and my family. Is there a um, party tonight? I have no idea. We're, we're think, supposed to go to a party at some yeah, point. We were, we That's top to secret, something. but yeah. Uh, yeah, because what was it? Emma Emma was here, and she was like talking about taking shots at Agat Alley. <laughs> really? I think before your race. And so... Okay. Um, that's you couldn't she, tell? <laughs> no, I have no idea. So that's what she got up to. I actually, um, oh, Emma Bates. Oh, I was going to yeah, say, not yeah. Emma Coburn. No, no, Emma Coburn was, like, was not taking that shots. Doesn't seem, that doesn't really check out. But, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we went to Agate Alley. I had like my entire family here. So it was, we kind of walked in and took over. Everyone had their like New Balance Go Corey shirts. It was, it was a fun time. Have you been to the Denny's here? <laughs> no, I have not. I have not. You've heard, though. I've heard about it. You've heard. <laughs> Denny's here is apparently historic, and even more history is being made. Now. Yeah, we might end up at Denny's tonight. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah, look out. <laughs> Are you going to stay all week? And I leave tomorrow. No. I just, yeah, I'm here to watch Emma, and yeah, then I'll head back to Boulder. But it's mostly because I leave a few da- in a few days for Europe to get my racing going on over there. Where are you going? Like, just a diamond league circuit sort of thing mm-hmm. so um emma and i will both go back to colorado tomorrow and then we'll base out of st moritz and then i'm actually gonna like try and do poland and then three days later race in monaco so hopefully i like can pull off another you know it's almost like the rounds again i smell a pr though <laughs> yeah, <coming>. so <laughs> that's the plan and then i'll come back and then go back over in a couple weeks so it's gonna be busy st moritz too big time for leuven now I would love to go back to Leuven, but Joe has me at altitude as much as possible. <laughs> we're, we're, we've been talking. Leuven 2023 is happening. That's us. happening? Yeah. yeah. I don't know a how long I later. get off work. <laughs> <laughs> Budapest. Um, what is the best part of professional running mm-hmm. and the worst part of professional running? Um, gosh. Usri, you can answer this one, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah Usri knows as well. I well, would say, like, travel is the best and the worst part because sometimes it's a lot. Of traveling and I just want to stay put for a second In but Boston. then I also <laughs> yeah and then but I also get to like see a lot of family and friends all over the place and see new places and um but sometimes yeah it's like I feel like I live out of a suitcase so yeah same it's you know you see in uh, somebody shine being professional and then behind scenes then you know you actually don't enjoy the times you just you know suitcase travel from place to place yeah yeah 
This is a question I like asking people, and you can take a deep breath and like think about it for one second okay. beforehand. Why should people root for you? There is so many different professional athletes out there, but like, if there is a fourteen-year-old girl at home who's like, I don't know who's my favorite. Who should I get the poster of? Why you? Um, I mean, uh, that's kind of tough. I would say like. Um, you probably, I know a lot of people love to run, but I really believe that like I'm doing the thing that I love so much. And like, I would be doing this, whether track was a sport or not, I would be like, even if this wasn't like some established measurable thing, I would be out trying to figure out how fast I can run for how far, like I would just love to compete, love to figure out how good I can be. And I am really like inspired by like kind of with the clock thing, with what happened to Devin. I get very passionate about what the point of track and field is. And it's like, as as one, like all of humanity, we're trying to discover how good people can be. And if I can like try and figure that out a little bit on behalf of all of us, like that's pretty much why I'm out there. And also why you can trust that like I'm doing it the right way. Um, Cause like I believe that I'm like a purist in the sport. so. I don't know. You can just trust me to try to work on that for all of us. So for the die hard runner, <laughs> yeah. like who just loves it so much. Yeah. They, that really will resonate. Yeah. I think it resonates too. I mean, I'm sure there's high school girls out there. I mean, you meet so many of them at New Balance Nationals where, you know, they might. Starstruck. Yeah, Star they get starstruck. Struck. But at the same time, they might also be thinking like, I really love this. Like, maybe they're similarly like to you, like their teammates don't love the sport as much, but to mm -hmm. hear that, I think that, you know, it goes, it goes a longer way than you think sometimes because, you know, sometimes there is that, that girl or that boy out there who's like, I need an athlete who, you know, loves this thing that I love as much as I, as I do. And like, I didn't know that those other people were out there. Yeah. I feel like that's it. I kind of like, I never was an outcast per se that was like in this, obvious way but I felt like an outcast growing up because I very much like loved running so much and really didn't think anyone else did and then I got into the world of track and field at the college level and now the pro level and I'm like oh it's really nice to like know that I'm not alone um so I feel like yeah the the kids that are like passionate about it but kind of feel a little bit out of place like I get you. <laughs> so I Do you mind if I add one yeah. thing? Oh you if <laughs> you probably ask better questions than no, we No I witnessed this. <laughs> Three nights ago, after the semifinal, at her house, we, had, we went for dinner uh, at her, and uh, two kids, two boys, we were sitting in the back, back porch. Mm -hmm. So why, you know, sh they should cheer for her? Or, she's approachable. So these kids, they're sitting asking the wildest, weirdest question about track and field, <laughs> and she's like, open her eyes, she tells, and they talk about how, I mean, it was unbelievable like how kind she was you know what i mean Thanks, she three. yeah i mean i witnessed that and it was and the kid was like are you the fifth fastest person in the world you know stuff like that so she'll answer and i was dying because it was so cute but she's approachable she's approachable she's kind and she gives the time and i seen it i witnessed it that's what happens when you grow up wanting to be a professional runner probably right yeah. so all right so we we had spoken to michael johnson just earlier and i was starstruck mm -hmm. like i i mean a hero mm -hmm. you're best friends now yeah, yeah we're best <laughs> friends um who in the the sport of track and field not just this weekend just in your lifetime was that person that you met that you were like oh my god yeah. i can't believe i'm shaking their hand or saying hello totally i mean i still have a hard time like i wanted to say so many things to allison this week and i just sit there and i'm like i see her and she's like about to get on the bus for the for the relay and I was like don't say anything like <laughs> you can't you. like, yeah, I was like <laughs> and I was like I was imagining myself like taking a picture of her without her knowing and I was like that'd be really cool to have a picture of her right before she you, like you goes a picture to together I, no I mean like I was gonna take a picture of her of without her, her knowing like, yeah. <laughs> but do you have a picture together you don't have a few no I don't and like I've sat Corey. behind her on the bus before like there's stuff like that where I'm like oh. and like I think she might know I think she might know my name like maybe and the I don't know so there's stuff like that where I'm like very starstruck by Allison to the point where like I can't even say hello um but then like I feel that way with a lot of people because um I think just going to like Melrose games growing up there was always watching Bernard Lagat like I yeah. now when I see him 
at meets and like, you know, know his sister, know his family, like the fact that I can talk to him like that. I still walk away from that conversation like very on edge and like I hope I didn't I th I hope he thinks I'm like I don't cool. know. I hope I he don't, likes yeah, me. Yeah, I hope Kip thinks I'm cool. I hope he likes me. <laughs> and so I feel that way big time with Lagat. Um, like always have loved watching him it's race. It's a childhood. Like, you know. Totally. It's like it goes like all the way to like the middle of my heart. I'm like just get so nervous and jittery. So um, definitely Lagat. Definitely Allison Felix. And I don't know. There's a variety of people, though. There's so many legends in the sport. But um, I mean, of course, with you three being my coach, I watched a lot of the Moroccan runners when I was young. So El Grouge was someone who I always admired. And um, but yeah, there's there's just a lot of people. So are you going to compete forever? Like when you're 60, 70 years old, no. you think of the 90 year old 100 no. meter dash at the Penn Relays. Are we in that? No, I, I could see myself like um, Joe and I actually laugh about this because we'll see people in Boulder who are like out crushing it on the track and um, he's like that's going to be you and I don't think that's going to be me but I can see myself like doing a lot of like strides and stuff like that like I'll go to the <laughs> track and do strides probably forever because like I just don't want to lose the feeling of like feeling that like light poppy like quick it changes real yeah. quick <laughs> you know. do you still run? yeah I do I may be 30, 40 miles a week. Yeah. yeah so, just, all right. So, but you don't, do you compete ever? Nah, I did. Yeah, but not anymore. But not anymore. Not anymore. So I'm, I run like 50 miles a week now yeah. and people think I'm insane. Yeah, yeah, Like yeah. that I would still even occasionally do a workout, just like mm -hmm. go to the track and do yeah. strides or yeah, like do yeah, something do that, easy, yeah. but like there's no races. Obviously, yes, you know? correct. Um, but I am doing the media 800 tomorrow. So yeah, I was going to say, what do you predict his time what do you is going to be? You know, just, you know, you can I, break you can break two for sure. Like yeah. you could All right. Come on, right. keep it going. Break what two. else? You know, yeah. how far under um, two do you think I got? Yeah, I think you could probably run like one fifty six. All right, that's fair. That's a very fair assessment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm lucky to break three. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do you have any guesses for Chris? <laughs> no, don't. <laughs> no, but it's. Uh, I always say, and Usri, I mean, now you and I can chat about this. Like going to the track and doing a workout, even when yeah. there's no goal. Like people go to the gym and they just lift That's your weights, fix. and it's like you're it's not doing a fix. body lift, yeah, like it's the body fix. competition. It's an addiction. Yeah, you know there is no reason why it's just run runs yeah. to the track and have fun. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely. Yeah. All right. So before we kick it to this interview, we've got uh, with Malcolm Gladwell, uh, Corey. What uh, for the people watching and listening to this? Uh, what are the next couple of races again uh, for them to look out for you? Yeah. So I will go to St. Moritz in a few days, and then I'll race in Poland. Um, okay. I'm not sure if that Diamond League has like occurred in the past, or if this is the first time. I think because of China. Okay. Yeah, I think they got it. So yeah. yeah, that's the one that I know 100. percent And then I'm pretty sure I'm racing Monaco, but I don't know if I've gotten final word on We've that. We've been told if you just show up, you can get it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm hoping um, that you guys want me to come compete there, and then uh, I'll come back, and then I'll go over and race in Brussels. And I'm hoping nice. that between those three races, that I have points for Zurich, and then I'll finish with Fifth Ave. I'm pretty sure. We might wow. see you there. Yeah. yeah, we'll see you there. Uh, sub four, you've envisioned it in your I head know, so I'm many times. I know, I'm knocking on the door. So. Yeah, so yeah. We're, we're waiting for it, too, uh, and rooting for you. So, Corey, you three, thank you guys so much for, for taking so time. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank thank you. And thank now you. we've got an interview with Malcolm Gladwell that Kyle and I uh, had the chance to catch up with earlier this morning. <laughs> this goes in so many different this directions. This is all <laughs> over the place. This is a fun interview. Um yeah, I mean, you're going to enjoy this one. This one is... I, I'd never... I'd gone for a run with Malcolm once mm -hmm. before. I've gotten my ass kicked in a mile by him before. <laughs> but I, I've never sat down and done anything, like, recorded with him, and, man, did we have some fun with this. If you're a cyclist, you're going to want to turn this <laughs> <Yeah>. one off. <laughs> All right, and now we are joined by New York Times bestselling author, Revisionist History podcast host... Legacy of Speed podcast host. We'll talk a little bit more, more about that. And the guy who kicked my ass in a mile last year, Malcolm Gladwell. Thanks for joining us here on Sidious Mag Live. My pleasure. So, first time in Eugene, right? So, what have you made right. of the the first couple hours in, in Track Town, USA, where you're just surrounded like track nerds like us? Why did I not come to college here? This is <laughs> like this is like runner's heaven. What was I doing, you know, anywhere else? That was my first, my first thought. It's um, not always like this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, but, you know, but I, but I was struck. You can clearly tell the people who are here for the world championships, but then you can also see like dozens and dozens of people who are clearly residents just out running. I mean, this is running heaven. Mm -hmm. 
I was complaining uh, just before we got on the podcast that, you know, the trail here really, it get, it's itchy and, you know, it's soft. It's nice. It, it, it's an acquired ability, I think, to really train in Eugene, but you, I'm sure you would have been fine on it. I would. No, no. This is like, this. the idea of, of devoting some portion of your life to just enjoying running, which is, you could do if you come here. Is days. there a bucket list thing that you have to do in Eugene before, like, have you seen Pree's Rock? If I will, if I were not injured, I would love to have gone for a long run on Pree's Trail. That you know, that's been a dream of mine for. I'm actually unlike you guys, old enough to remember Pree. <laughs> you, he's. He, I don't even sure you guys. I were watched born. Without Limits <laughs> as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, he's legit. He might even be. He, I'm barely older. Th- I'm barely younger than him. <laughs> you know. So he's he's. Uh, when I was actually a young runner, he was actively running. That's how old I am. So quick update, you mentioned being injured. I can't believe how many questions both you and I have probably fielded about a possible rematch between the two of us in a, in a mile. I mean, just the discussion of that mile has gone on for way too long. Like, I kind of hate it now. <laughs> yeah. People, people stop me on the street. I was in, um, I was like somewhere in Europe. And some guy comes up to me and says, wait, you're the dude who... You know, you're the dude who took down Chris Chavez, and <laughs> <laughs> it's like I forget where I was. It was, I, it was just like so. In co- it was like completely out of context. It was fantastic. So the way we grow the sport is just have me in the <laughs> Olympic trials, and everyone who beats me would end up being a global superstar. Yeah, at least in Europe. <laughs> yeah. So uh, injured, no running for for a bit. So we're postponing this rematch at least to 2023. Yeah, I'm I'm down for 2023. Um, absolutely. Do we want to toy? Do we want to make it a half mile? An 800. Well, I don't know if that helps or hurts, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd be down for, for a half mile. I'm I think. To- we'll, we'll see if I can break three minutes tomorrow in the media 800 <laughs> here uh, in Eugene. So, yeah, totally. I hope you get back. You're in love with the Elliptigo. I, uh, according I'm to Strava. Elliptigo, I'm an Elliptigo convert. Um, anyone who listens, I will go on and on and on about how amazing it is. Um, I wish I'd known about it 20 years ago. It Basically, it's... The, you know, I had this long-standing aversion to cycling. I'll denounce cycling, even though I do a lot of cycling. I just think it's the stupidest thing. The person who designed bicycles, it's a sport that is completely revolves around the idea that you have to suffer in order to get exercise. This might be the hottest take that <laughs> we've had yet. Even, even the Canadian Mike Woods just want to stage sub four minute miler. We're out on cycling completely. It's just, it is the most, and everyone who cycles, it's 90% about the gear. Like, all they talk about is the gear. They don't even talk about cycling. They just talk about, like, how much their bicycle weighs, how much it costs, where, which Rafa store they got their $7,000 singlet. Like, the whole, it's just the most absurd um, exercise. And also, you know, legit one in every hundred cyclists dies at some point during their cycling career. So it's like, I have no, I, I have no idea why this, why this sport is somehow this kind of, you know, cool in thing for people to do and running is not. This, we, is, the, <laughs> this is the clip that's going to light up yeah, your like, mentions. Yeah. We did not discuss this in the pre-recording. I also do not endorse <laughs> <laughs> that at all. No, but elliptical uh, <laughs> solves all of the cycling problems. Big elliptical, you know, they're the ones who are... Funding you to say such a no, thing. No, no, no. Funding, funding. I paid. I paid a hundred percent of the cost of my elliptigo, and I. Uh, it solves all the biking problems. You can go out for two and a half hours. You have no soreness. Your butt's not killing you. Your back's not about to like go out. You're not going to die because you're going two thirds the speed. You're, you're taller wheels. than the car. You're taller than the car. You're not clipped in. You're two and in- three inches from the ground. I mean, the whole thing is superior. It's like, think about it this way. If, if we go back to when the bicycle was invented, if instead of inventing the bicycle, they had invented the elliptigo, so it's like the, whatever it is, the 18th century. If they'd started with the elliptigo, the bike would be this like weird, it's like, I saw some guy, it's all hunched over and it's really dangerous. Why would they do that? Everyone would be like, why are we not, why is not the elliptigo the kind of, it's, one of, it's just a timing problem. Jeff Karen would be on our podcast, like denouncing the elliptico in this scenario. We'd be switched around. That's right. yeah. You know, the Tour de France would be on ellipticos. And then there would be a weird moving out of California to do this whole kind of. There's, thing. There is a world championships for the elliptico. I know, I'm aware of that. This yeah. is like a revisionist history, like an alternative history to but it's, the Tour de France. It, you know, it doesn't replace running, but it supplements it in a beautiful way. Anything that gets you outside instead of being in the pool. Mm hmm. 
Like, yes. I, yeah, yeah. You know, I think the the only thing that I would hate more than to be a swimmer is to be a parent of a swimmer who has to drop oh. the kids off at the pool at 5 a.m. on a yeah. Tuesday morning. So no swimming Kyle, for Alicia. <laughs> yeah. You and I are both in the same boat. We have children of babies of babies basically the same age. Queuing up at the, the New York State meet 18, <laughs> or I guess probably we, 14, 15 years yeah, from now. Just, we have a standing bet 15 years from now. We both have daughters. And the standing bet is who wins. In the, It's got to be... We haven't set the distance, but maybe we should let our daughters have some say in this. <laughs> That's very kind of us, yeah. And even if they want to do a field event, we'll allow such a but thing. But I, I, even though you are 10 to 15 times better runner than I am, um, I'm still hopeful because uh, my uh, partner is is where I... I was going to say, it's not, just, it's not just the dad's genes know, involved here. I'm, I'm banking heavily on the genetic input. <laughs> Of the mother in this case, I'm irrelevant. It's yeah. really her. You know, Patricia. You know, she came. She, she she ran in college. She came over for the, <laughs> to the did. states on a scholarship. That's why we met. What's, give me some give me some PRs for Patricia. <laughs> she's, yeah, <laughs> she's gonna be furious. Uh, <laughs> she ran thirty four twenty for ten k in Central Park. It's probably her best. Oh wow, twenty seven zero in it, Central Park for eight k. Yeah, she's yeah. gonna be so mad that we're discussing this right so, now. So, uh, Kate. So she can move. Kate was a fifty-four point four hundred meter. So runner we're coming at different angles. I know. That's why this makes me think that this should be eight hundred meters. First child, <laughs> Speedy Edie, right? Is that Speedy Edie is her, <laughs> or, or Alicia to win a, a New York State title? What's what's on the line? <clears throat> You know, I mean, <laughs> I'll go for an elliptical ride, or you can come for a bike ride. Lifetime supply of Tracksmith kit yeah. for the kid. Okay, yeah. I think that's what it is. Matt, are you down for this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not even going to bring up the fact that I am clearly decked out in Columbia colors for good reason. Right <laughs> so, so he joked about. Uh, Wait, I have one last question. Okay, yeah, yeah. About uh, is it Leisha? Leisha. Leisha. Um, what, so right now, not walk, but there's crawling. She crawled the first day I got here. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. What do you? What have you observed about speed of crawling? Do you see? Well, I haven't observed anything. I've been in <laughs> Eugene, got, but but you've got videos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, have, you any, have you clocked it at all yet, or are you? She's at form? a she's a fast learner. What started as just a couple like light crawls now. Yeah. I, we're, we're, we're bringing in the jail, the cage. Oh, yeah. we, so we, we, we got to keep track. You, now I think you, you blink and she's on the other side of the room. Yeah. Speedy Edie <laughs> is living up to her. By the way, the reason, the reason I lobbied heavily and successfully that she, my daughter should be called Edie was because I wanted to <laughs> exclusively call her Speedy. Because I thought I could, I could plant this idea from day one that she should, that movement quickly was the, the aim of movement, right? <laughs> yeah. So Speedy... Is living up to her, is her crawling is a sensation. It's when did she start crawling? Yeah, probably uh, f six weeks ago. Oh, at she's a, ahead of no, Lisa. no, but she's older. She's older. Oh, okay, she's older. Yeah, but the the form is spectacular. <laughs> I mean, uh, Sancho esque. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, it is, uh, I'm very very excited at this point. See, I wanted to call our daughter Leisha because she's an Irish citizen, and when she eventually, you know goes over and runs for Ireland in the Olympics, even yeah. though she is, you know, living and growing up in America, I wanted to like, you know, keep the, keep the, the, the potential hate for an American yeah. coming over, you know, at bay. I love so the, the strong Irish name. I love that you've already lined up the small country where it's easier to make the Olympic team. Uh, maybe now, but 18 years from now, Ireland is going to be top notch. Really? Don't worry. Yeah. Well, Speedy Edie is technically, uh, she has several options. She is English. That's not happening, right? <laughs> uh, there's Canada, but Canada's a Middle Eastern's power yeah, right now. Yeah. Here's uh, she. Uh, she's um, mother's Jewish, so we can do right of return to Israel. The Maccabi game. What country is easier to make the Olympic team in middle distance in Israel? I mean, this has got to be the easiest. <laughs> this is like, you ever looked at the Israeli uh, national records? Well, the marathon national record on the women's side is very good now, thanks to Sal Peter. But uh, <laughs> but in general, yeah, yeah, not. no. They're not overwhelming. Um, wait, and then Jamaica potential, or now we going to? So I don't know what, how, how many the Jamaican how many rules? passports is one individual so allowed many. to have and not be named so, Jason Bourne? So, <laughs> many, so I don't know how Jamaican nationality rules work. So her her grandmother is Jamaican, her father is English, her mother is American and uh, Jewish American, and then there's the Canada thing. I have a Canadian passport. 
So I maybe she can go in all those directions. I think it's a game time decision for her <laughs> about which country is the most is the easiest national team to make. Whoever is going to pay up the most, whatever federation. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I mean, if we want to bring this back to running, because I know this was not the direction Chris had intended this podcast. No, to it's go. fine. Um, I'm having fun. Well, something you know, we saw in Ireland and other s- small countries you know, with the world rankings where athletes are ranked inside the bubble and then not being selected because they're deemed, you know, maybe not competitive enough actually yeah. arriving at the world championship. So that could also be a factor. I hate the ranking system. I can go on all day. Yeah, 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 I, yeah. I told Seb that I hate it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So he kind of joked about uh, a revisionist history episode on the bicycle. But I think a lot of people for a while had been asking you is like when are you going to do one on running when are you going to do one on running and now to kind of tie in legacy of speed you finally have come out with a podcast way to bring it back track and field yeah yeah to rescue it from a discussion (laughs) of our daughters um yes so yeah no legacy of speed for the longest time i've wanted to do i did one revisionist history on running um in part remember about the oh the golf golf courses courses in los angeles but the first pure running one yeah this legacy of speed thing which has been so fantastic um which is this podcast we did with uh, Tracksmith um, that's about the iconic 1968 Mexico Olympic Games photograph. The, that Tommy Smith and John Carlos on the victory stand of the 200 with their fists raised and black socks and no shoes and heads bowed during the national anthem. And it's the story behind that photograph. And it is an amazing story. I knew, I'm a, you know, I'm about as serious a track fan as you could be i would i think i knew maybe 10 percent of that story before wow before we started um and uh so it was it's a kind of we just walk you through you know the fact that first of all everyone's from san jose state which is so strange san jose state um is the greatest track and field program in the world in the 1960s i mean it's this school that commuter school and their sprinting program they have, I think there's, I've forgotten exactly how many world records were held by San Jose State runners in the late 50s and 60s, but it's an astonishing long list. And all those guys at the 68 games, Lee Evans, who sets the world record in the 400 meters, and Tommy Smith, who sets the world record in the 200 meters, and John Carlos, who gets a, who gets a bronze medal in the 200, they're all on the same track team at San Jose State. They all have the same coach. It's this incredible, you know, we, we talk endlessly about John Wooden at UCLA in that era as being this this extraordinary moment where one coach, down, what was happening at San Jose State is the equal, if not the the superior to that. Something that I really like you, you know, kind of opening up the and talking about in the podcast is that balance of amateurism in college mm-hmm. sports and the professional world and the Olympics. And I feel like what's happening in college sports today is really relevant and tied into that conversation because you know, you tell the story of how little these athletes were living on. And meanwhile, they're the best athletes in the entire world scraping yeah. by to even just get a pair of shoes. Yeah. Yeah. The, the podcast has a villain um, who really is. a. I mean, he's a Bond villain. Yeah. It's Avery Brundage, Sebco's predecessor, the, man, the man who really builds the modern Olympic movement and who is a in every way a despicable human being. There is not a single he does not have a single redeeming quality. <laughs> He is like a racist, sexist, troglodyte who, you know, he's the guy who goes over to Nazi Germany in 36 to say, to give the okay, to say, actually, they're not that bad. I heard he got there by bike. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And he, so he's around, he dominates. The modern Olympics are really built by this guy, Avery Brundage, who takes over the games after the 40s and runs the games through the 70s, through the Munich games. And he has a, excuse me, he has a commitment, an obsessive commitment to amateurism, which does not simply mean in his mind that a, an Olympic athlete cannot take any money for what they do. It also means that they must remain outside of, um, they have to confine themselves to sports. They can't speak to politics. The minute he saw any athlete trying to participate in any broader conversation in the world, he went apeshit. <laughs> and he would, you know, kick people out of, of the Olympic movement, he would. So when the athletes in 68, these young African-American men in America who are very much aware, you know, we forget what, how nuts um, the kind of uh, racial politics in America were by the late 60s. 
67 is the long hot summer where there were 150 race riots. And I mean, the whole country was at, so here we have these guys who are very o- politically aware, also happen to be the greatest sprinters in the world, about to go on a world stage, and they feel compelled to do something or say something. And yet, if they do that, they are up against what, you know, uh, a, a, a principle of amateur athletics at that time, which is you're not allowed to ever speak to what's going on in the games, in the, in the, in the broader world. And then they get to Mexico City, and the, you know, the thing that we've forgotten is now, but 10 days before the games begin, there is a slot that the Mexican army slaughters all these protests, protesters in a square in central Mexico. It may have been as many as 100 people um, killed in that, in that. It's unclear how many were. So, like, the whole, everyone is aware that, like, this world is kind of going nuts. Mm-hmm. And these guys feel they have to do something about it. And this that's sort of the story we're telling in the podcast. When you said that, you know, as a diehard track fan, you only knew 10% of the story. Like, what is out there? Because, I mean, when we've kind of gone on runs and I've asked you about your process of writing revisionist history and how mm-hmm. you write out all the episodes and that's the equivalent of like writing a book. So by the time that this, you know, series is over is like the book written on, you know, the protests at the 68 Olympics or is there still, I mean, how many hours of interviews and stuff do you have from, from this, the reporting process to, to create this? Yeah. Could we do more? We could, I realize now that, you know, the, the doing legacy of speed as kind of, um, opened me, opened so many kind of doors in my mind to other mm-hmm. things that I'd love to explore. It's pretty clear to me, for example, and we touch on this in the podcast, but you could do another whole podcast on the links between the kind of activism we're seeing today and what happened in 68. I mean, there's a kind of template that is laid down there. Um, Colin Kaepernick is, uh, is, is, is squarely in the tradition of 68. And the fact that Kaepernick... Um, comes along 50 years after Mexico City and essentially does what those athletes did on the stand in, in, the, in 68 and gets chased out of his sport suggests how little has movement there has been in kind of public acceptance of athletes speaking up in 50 years. I mean, it's kind of amazing. Like, what actually, what Kaepernick does is less confrontational and controversial and out there than what happened in 68. He's just taking a knee. He's not, he's not raising his fist and have a with a black glove on it. And it's and even then, the entire NFL, as far as I can tell, the entire NFL culture has a collective freakout over this. So um, it's really interesting how uh, much the world of sport has kind of lagged behind in accepting the idea that athletes can be socially conscious. Listening to the Bond villain talk in, with my 2022 brain, I was just like, just come out and say you only want rich white people to be able to participate in sports. Yeah. Like it, it was, it was, you know, he, he said it as politically correct as you could possibly say it without saying that exact thing. And I think especially today when we talk about the opportunity and the privilege of certain athletes versus others, it was very apparent that, you know, it was racially motivated in many ways. Oh, yeah. I mean, we talk about... And in one of those episodes, I talk a little bit about how, in Avery Brundage's mind, Roger Bannister was the ideal, mm-hmm. you know, the first man to break the four-minute mile. And by the way, I'm not dissing Roger Bannister. He's a childhood hero of mine. But he's the perfect Avery Brundage athlete. So we have a privileged white uh, Englishman going to who go, who's getting his medical degree at Oxford who runs on his lunch hour and who, you know, graciously and brilliantly breaks the four-minute mile and then bows out of the world of sports and is an am- a broader ambassador for the world of sports for as long as he lives as he has an incredibly successful medical career on the side, right? That's the model, right? That you should be a kind of fully developed gentleman who dabbles in sport and then goes on to do something of, uh, of, of you know, greater significance in society. A lovely model, by the way, but there's just no... The, the idea that we should... We only accept that kind of narrow definition of what an athlete's allowed to be in the world is what's so preposterous about it. And you're right, it is completely exclusive of anyone who happens not to be going to Oxford and leading this wonderful, privileged life. <laughs> there was a point in one of the episodes, I think it might have been in the first or, or second one, where 
you talk about uh, the coach uh, Bud Bud Winter Bud Winter yeah. who the way one of the easiest things I think he got his athletes to do is just kind of like relax mm. and and so I've uh, after listening to that episode I was like wait that's what Fred Curley does like he does he looks the most relaxed of all the sprinters what else have you like kind of in mm -hmm. the process of spending time with some of these all-time great sprinters picked up on the sprints that maybe you didn't beforehand I so I did not. So Bud Winter is the coach. All of these great runners who come out of San Jose State have the same coach, this guy mm -hmm. Bud Winter, who I think it's pretty, who I knew nothing about. This is one of the great discoveries of doing the Legacy of Speed show. And it's pretty clear to me now that Bud Winter is one of the most important coaches of the 20th century. And what he does is he brings these ideas about relaxation, which had been developed during the Second World War, um, to help pilots deal with the stress of, of, of fighting over Germany. Um, and he brings them to sprinting and to running in general. And the basic idea was, which was at the time, now it's so obvious to us, we don't think of it as being an innovation. In the 60s and early 50s, late 50s, it was a radical notion, which was the way to compete, to extract maximum performance from, your, from the body, human body, is to relax. So is to hold back, in a certain sense, your level of effort which is, was at the time was a deeply counterintuitive idea. So when you see Fred Curley or Usain Bolt or all these sprinters now for whom it's second nature that, you know, in, on, at the 80th meter in the 100 meters, you look, look like if you push them, they'll fall over, right? Their upper body is so composed. Their face is not in a grimace, but it's... I was watching Arian Knighton last night in the 200 meter uh, semis and, you know, he's, he looks like he's... You didn't know that he was going at 50 miles an hour. You would think he was just out for a stroll, right? That's the ideal. And that's, in it. that's not the way human beings naturally sprinted. We thought you had to grimace and, but no, we, and Bud Winter's the guy who teaches the world, and really the world. He starts with his own athletes, but then he goes on a crusade around the world. And the Jamaicans are the f one of the first places who listen to him, who say that relaxation is the way to maximum performance. That's a incredibly radical idea that comes out of there was another <coughs> point in an episode uh was it uh tommy smith who was i think broke a world record and you said like i would have given anything to have been in that stadium or no no so what happens is that it, tommy smith and lee evans two right. of the greatest sprinters of all time double world record holders they're on the same track team and their coach won't let them race each other which mm -hmm. i just think is nuts but he was but they managed they sneak out one day, they, without telling, basically without telling their coach, they sneak in a head-to-head -head race on the cinder track at San Jose State. This is like less. <laughs> did, did you? I don't know if you you were probably traveling to Eugene, but we had Trayvon Bromel and Marvin Bracy here, and they uh -huh. told us that on the night out they were talking crap to each other, like after the hundred. Yeah. Was, they, With Fred, yeah, they all met up. It was, uh, I think, <laughs> Trayvon texted Marvin and said, uh, "Fred wants to get a shot." And so they went out looking for a bar that was open. Nothing was open in Eugene. So they're just walking the street and they're recounting the races, uh, race to each other. Yeah. And then it, it kind of, they start laughing and joking. And then it almost gets to the point where they want to rematch. Shoes a foot are race kicked off in the street. Are you oh, this yeah. Is fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Can I just say, this is exact what track and field needs is like this times 10. And for one of them to this look, camera look at right this here, camera. you can say anything positive about Sidious Mag that you want. <laughs> they should have texted you and said, get over here with your phone. Let's do this right now at like whatever it was, 1030 at night. It was, like, I think, a little later than 1030 yeah. at night. <laughs> this is 100% what we need. Like, this is the spirit of this. This is the, this is the absolute spirit of the sport, right? Yeah. I mean, it's like just three guys throwing it down at, you know, whatever it is. If even if it's one in the morning, wake up, Chris and Kyle, wake up. We're doing, <laughs> and we break the news as if, yeah, yeah. as if that is the race that would count. Racing to the street post barefoot. That that but race counts. The one in the stadium doesn't. Does. That's pride. Yeah. I mean, I I do think. Um, well, well, let me just finish the yeah, yeah. the uh, the. So these guys basically, so Evans and 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 Tommy Smith sneak in a race, <laughs> like in their kind of and like. Everyone hears about it, and like people are hanging it from the trees, and they're on this cinder track, and it's like they run something. And um, uh, Tommy Smith wins. I think actually, the case for Tommy Smith being one of the greatest sprinters of all time 
now that I've done this, is getting stronger and stronger in my mind. But it's like this epic under the radar thing. And if I want more of that, the sport needs more of that. Like I feel like we get so caught up in the formalities of the sport that we forget that what's appealing about the sport is, is its simplicity. It really is, let's you know, strip down in the middle of the night and go for a race. That's what, that, that's what running's about. That's why running is not like cricket or basketball which, or you know, downhill skiing, which need to have all these contrivances to, to stage a competition. We don't need any contrivances. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that our sport does a poor job of, is we like to compare eras by time. Mm -hmm. And no other sport really does that. Like in basketball, you're not comparing, you know, Dr. J would get dunked on by LeBron today. You, you compare people to their era a little bit more. And yeah. because we have this finite number, like that's how fast that's he ran. List. That's yeah. how fast he ran. Therefore, he is better. It's and, and irrelevant. It's a way of making our history irrelevant as a sport, which is crazy. Why would we, you know, why would we do that? I totally agree. The second someone's time is beat, it's like, and thank you for your service. Yeah. <laughs> we will forget your name in 10 years. That's why Maurice Green is knocking on our door <laughs> most days and just coming <laughs> to hang out. It's, yeah. yeah. So my, my, my follow-up to that was, been, you, you said you would have loved to have been in that stadium. What are some other moments in track and field history that you would, like, maybe give me, like, a top other two um, that, that you would have loved to have been in the stadium for? Well, there has to have been, I don't know which one I would like to have gone to, but there has to have been uh, a champs, you know, the big Jamaican mm. yes. uh, track and field. I, that, I think we need that's to go. on our bucket yeah. list. There's yeah. got to have been, but I'd like to have gone back. Let's go back through the last 30 years of champs. There has to have been one that was epic. I mean, there's more than one that was epic. But I would like to have been at the, where everybody was there, right? Where the young Johan Blake is running against the young Usain, whatever it is, whatever the kind of lineup is. There was that, or the, you know, to see Shelly M. Fraser Price at 13. Yeah. You know, what, you know, what was, you know, that is that something I'd definitely love to have, have done and seen. Um, some, there's got to have been an epic cross country race in England in the 70s where everyone from that era when English run, middle distance running was off the charts, where everybody's in the same race. That would be amazing. And they're all slogging through mud and, it's raining and cold, like just a real English, like, mm -hmm. and to go to the pub afterwards and get a pint with, you know, the 21 year old Steve Ovad and the, you know, the 23 year old Brendan Foster, that would have been. It sounds amazing. like we need to bring them to the Morton games. Yeah, you got to come us. to the Morton games with us. They have the, with, on 200 meters, they have their clubhouse with like an old Irish pub, you know, it's in Dublin. Uh -huh. And uh, immediately after the race, everyone it's filters too, up to the so. top. And it's the Clonliffe Harriers is the oldest club, like in Dublin, where all the great yeah. Irish and the, the, all the old paraphernalia on the wall and stuff. Like it's really oh, cool. That sounds amazing. But uh, so, yeah. all right, so cross country, um, I'm, you know, uh, Kipchoge is very good at running. And he decided that he's going to go back to Berlin and not go to the New York City Marathon this fall. Yeah. And, you know, he's ducking it's, you. it's the well, I don't know. We'll see if I get a bib. Um, and so, you know, Wait, you're going to run the I'm contemplating just for fun. I'm trying to get Mac to do it with me. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so he, he wants to go break the world record again. But, you know, there's also this prospect of him having six world marathon majors. And, you know, he's slowly yeah. getting he's still the best, but he's slowly getting up there in age. And so the opportunities are dwindling. But Berlin's fast and New York is hilly, so he, he's going to go back to Berlin. And, you know, I think there's, and I, you know, uh, compared to your bicycle take, not that hot of a take, but like to speak anything negative of Kipchoge seems crazy. But on my, in my head, it's like, you got to do New York and win these things. And so I was looking through his, you know, just list of accomplishments and something that was absent was a world cross title. You know, he, mm -hmm. he I think, got one as a junior, but world cross at yeah. one point in history, was a huge, huge and race. Yeah. And, and you it know, that's yeah. that Bekele's accomplishment. And when we're talking about why maybe Bekele might be the best distance runner of all time, which is still a discussion for yeah. sure of, of who it would be. World Cross and his performance is there. Just a lot of medals. Yeah. A lot. And so I guess I'm just curious, your, your thoughts of where cross country yeah. and World Cross maybe specifically – now, at 2026, it's going to be in the U.S. in Tallahassee. Where does that fit in everything when we're analyzing who the best of all time is? Well, I've, so I have strong feelings about this. 
<laughs> I um, one is te- our model here should be tennis. Um, World Cross shouldn't move around every year. There should be like two wor- cross country majors, and they should be in exactly the same place. Where one do you want should them? be muddy and cold <laughs> and like whatever, and one should be you know dry and warm and hot, and. We should be familiar with the courses. They should be, it should be like, you know, Wimbledon. This is the thing about tennis. Tennis, which by the way, it, it, it kind of boggles the mind that tennis commands as large an audience as it does for its majors. Because, and here I'm, maybe this is another incendiary take. You know, it's, these, these matches last like at the pro level, like five hours. Yeah. I mean, it's just ridiculous how long, and it's just guys serving over and over again at each other and people whiffing. That's essentially tennis. Why do they have these extraordinarily, why are they so successful as a spectator sport? Because there's a mythology around each of the majors. Wimbledon is an event, right? You know when it is, you know what it's like, you know what's distinctive about it, you know how it differs from the French or the US Open. You know, the crowds at the US Open are a special thing that make the game kind of worth it. We need to build that kind of mythology around Cross country, it, it could work, you know, particularly in an age where you can make a televised version of a cross country race come alive now. You can have drones that are flying over the court. There's a million things you can do to make it a, an immersive spectator experience. So I think there's that. And secondly, I think that the team portion in cross country is way, way underplayed. It really should be about who wins the team and not who wins the individual, and that the teams should be really large. You know, this is another one of my hobby horses. Yeah, you're, you're listening you're to Rich d- Roll. Yeah, yeah your yeah. Team, and you you're emailed me about this. <laughs> yes. yeah. The teams should be minimum in World Cross, minimum 10, but I would be happy with 20 runners per team, and your score is just the combined times of your 20 runners. So what we're really interested in is, can you go 20 deep? So it Sounds expensive. Okay, expensive <laughs> compared to what? You know... When, because, because I, th- I really feel like a, a twenty-team world cross country, twenty deep team cross country thing brings Japan into the into the mix. It makes you passionately interested in your team depth. It means you care really who your eighteenth and nineteenth and twentieth runners are. I mean, it's super interesting. It drive it will drive participation in the sport and it changes the mentality. We're not done with the race once the winner crosses the line. This is the craziest thing about, about running. It's like we have a system where we have 100 people competing in world cross country, and the minute the top three people uh, finish, we're done. We no longer care. Who, who does this? What sport consigns 97% of the participants to oblivion once the top three people finish, right? Mm-hmm. If you do a proper team thing you should be as interested in uh the hundredth person crossing the line as you were in the first you know what sport you'd love (laughs) cycling (laughs) (laughs) well they know they do do a good they do on this in this one minor respect they do do a good job despite the absurdity of every other aspect of of their sport Oh, uh, I don't know. Have you ever been to like the Great Edinburgh Cross races? So something that Europe does much, much better yeah. than the U.S. is the looped courses. Yes, yeah. because from a spectator's perspective, in the U.S., if you're going to go watch a 10k, you run an 8k. Yeah. <laughs> Essentially, like just try if you want to actually watch any of the race. And so yeah. in Europe, you know, oftentimes it's a, a 2k loop. And Edinburgh, if you've never been to the city I've in general, which I'm t- sure I've you've been, but an amazing city. I was lucky enough to run across there. Actually, a mixed gender four by one k cross country race. Yeah. So hardly your your normal <laughs> race, but um, you know, watching like Garrett Heath and you know take down the likes of Mo Farah. Wait, that's the one I watched on TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's well, so, so, at, you know, he took he took down Mo multiple times in, at the peak of Mo, and yeah. that's like kind of the beautiful thing about cross is it's yeah. it's a it's an equalizer in a way, and you have those upsets. But Garrett actually um, was visiting me, and he stayed over one night, and a buddy of mine who hadn't known Garrett was there, but had obviously watched Garrett race, and so we uh, cracked open a, a few beers and a bottle of whiskey, and we made Garrett watch the race with us, mm-hmm. and just 
commentate (laughs) everything that was happening and going through his mind and whatnot. And I thought it was like the coolest way to relive the race because oftentimes you watch a race and then, you know, you said and forget and you don't watch it again for seven years. And so I, I I watched that race live. I thought it was one of the coolest things. And then I, I just personally think cross country when presented properly on TV is a spectacle in much the way that we would hope like the Wimbledons and such do it. The, the, Another model for this, a really interesting one, would be the the golf model of the FedEx points. So in 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 pro golf, you have a series of events that, and your 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 how well you do in each of these events um, gives you a certain number of points. In what league? In, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, now they're in a whole other. <laughs> but then, and then there's a lot of money at stake at the end of the year for the person who has the most FedEx points. But imagine for uh, middle and long distance runners where we had. Uh, a series where you, you know you you had two cross country majors, the world championships and or Olympics, and a series of diamond lead events, and then whatever other road races we want to throw in. So we put together a roster of ten events, of ten sort of semi compulsory events that are that are uh, points earning events, and the person who does the best across those ten events is the that year's you know they win some insane amount of money, they get all kinds of. That strikes me as super interesting in driving interest across the uh, across the year. I think calling it a FedEx points or something like that is probably yeah, something that yeah. the I'll tell you, track USAT- doesn't do. Well, yeah. USATF has it for road racing. It's just it's not marketed uh, and it's never and it out should there. Be, but it should be. It should be. It should be integrated with cross country and track. Oh, yeah, should, yeah. You should have to do a whole range of things in order to be to to be to be crowned the king. My point that I like to make all the time is we. And I, I think some of the events that are popping up now are, are brilliant. Like the stuff that Jesse Williams is doing with sound running. Like if, if it wasn't for the 10Ks he was putting on, then we wouldn't have 10K fields yeah. <laughs> at the World Championships. But I do think that we need to lean into the historic events a little bit more. Like we have the pen relays and I feel like we don't appreciate it as a sport enough. It's this thing yeah. that has transcended the sport. Everyone knows what the pen relays is. And yet... We're not building it up to be the Wimbledons that it should be because there's already the history involved there. And yet, like, we can't seem to make that the thing on the calendar that everyone circles. Yeah. Getting a pen relays wheel or watch in college is something very, very special. And the USA versus the world used to be a little bit bigger of a deal than it is now. But I just think that's such a missed opportunity to let events like that not be yeah. the majors. Yeah, we don't, I mean, as a sport, which is. To bring us back to Legacy of Speed for a moment, the as a sport we do us you I realize doing it that we do such an incredibly bad job of storytelling around our own history. I mean, that that's an insane story that's been sitting there for fifty years and it's been told in little bits and pieces, but like other sports would have been all over this kind of um, and they our our instinct for maybe it's because runners are particularly Middle and long distance runners are introverts who aren't used to mm-hmm. <laughs> banging our own drums. We're not. We don't do a good job of this kind of uh, um, storytelling. So that you'd be a Cade Flat guy, right? Like uh, uh, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> have you Have you watched? Oh yeah yeah yeah. yeah. The, um, well, didn't I didn't I email you about whether we could divide? Yes, yes, right, give sporting. your Give your <laughs> take on this. Uh, well, it, it was well it was um it was, it was Cade, Cade and Gary Martin and Gary Martin. And whether you could divide the entire middle distance world into the flat group and the Martin group, um, <laughs> who you identify with more? I'm a, I identify with Martin. Okay. Although you Some know, vague resemblance. I desperately, yeah. I desperately want more Cade Flats. I love what a big talker he is. I think it's fantastic. Um, but no, like you know, Gary Martin is like the. He's like, who doesn't want to be Gary Martin? He's like, <laughs> he's like, seems like he seems so cool and you know, understated, and he goes off to his prom after, you know, <laughs> breaking four What minutes. does it say about our sport that we're, like, most intrigued by two high schoolers <laughs> right now? Um, well, it's good, though. First of all, that's the pattern for the super successful sports. They drive interest early. When LeBron James was, James was 13, people, everyone in the world of basketball knew who he was. This is not a bad thing for us to be to start our to start building, you know, this is one of the things about when doing Legacy of Speed. One of the things that so struck me was that 
uh, Tommy Smith and Lee Evans and John Carlos, they had their one moment in 68, and then they were done. I mean, there, there was no afterlife for them. They had, that, was their, that was really the only Olympic Games in which they were, they, in fact, that was the only Olympic Games in which any of them competed. Then they went into oblivion, partly because they were blacklisted, blackballed after, because of their protest, but also because there was no place for runners. You know, you, the, if you were an amateur athlete in the 60s, you couldn't afford to keep running once you left college, right? Like, that's the legacy we're struggling with. We don't, we've, and if you have, if you, your heroes only have a moment that's won Olympic Games, you're never going to have real heroes, mm -hmm. right? Heroes, there has to be this kind of, which is getting very close to my other thing I want to rant about. But <laughs> you, <laughs> you call, you've got our platform here. No, <laughs> longevity yes. is central to building any kind of popular interest in a sport. And we have done a bad job of rewarding the athletes who are who have real longevity in their in their careers. We're more interested in peak performance than in longevity, and that's a problem. Well, you look at the contracts that are handed out now. It's like if you run fast in high school, here is a million dollars, and then you know you make it through an Olympic cycle. Let's say, and we're cheering for the the young athletes so hard, and then finally they get to the top, and let's say like they they win that Olympic gold. We're just and not me, we, like, collectively, like, what happens in the sport, it's almost like you then just wait for the downfall. And yeah. it's, we don't appreciate when people are on the top of their game enough until it's too late. And then what ends up happening from a financial perspective is it's like your first contract's the biggest contract. And the younger you are, the more valuable you are. And then if you don't get a good contract immediately after college, then, you know, you can graduate, be unsponsored for two years, do amazing, and then all of a sudden, no, you're not worth anything to anyone. That's yeah. That's why we harped so much uh, during the U.S. Championships of like, oh, it was. We were so pumped to see Evan Jager back at the top of his form because it was like we didn't appreciate like every one of those years. It was Evan was winning, Evan was winning, and we just mm -hmm. kind of like that was it. And now when we got to see him, that the steeplechase was hard for him. It was like it was tough to watch as well and so you know in the same sense uh, Emma Coburn winning 10 straight titles like that is something that like she got so emotional because you know we have to appreciate the this moment that we're in right now and so uh yeah I mean it's it's one of those things it kind of it ties into what your Nick Willis point and, and why yeah. we have to appreciate these stars more yes this is okay. what this is when I wanted to defend my comments which I took some flack um unfairly I thought um <laughs> over saying that I think that Nick Wellis belongs in the very, very um, upper echelon of Milers. And I compared him to Matt Sanchewitz, and I said, I think of him on a higher level. And the reason is, for this very, for the, because of the longevity thing, that first of all, you have someone who's broken four minutes in 20 consecutive years. That's actually an incredibly important accomplishment. More than important, it's an epic accomplishment. Secondly, he's someone who has, is relevant on the world stage for, I mean, he was a threat to win every race he enters for almost 10 years, right? For Willis? Willis. Mm -hmm. More. More. Yeah. Breaks 333 times over, the, over that span. Medals in, uh, in two, two Olympic Games, eight years apart. Um, <clears throat> You can argue, and I think he actually, I think he deserves the, why, if you're caught for doping, you should relinquish all of your medals. So that would make Willis the gold medal winner uh, if you, if you, if you, if you kick, eight, um, right? yeah. yeah, if you, if you kick, um, uh, Asbel Kipson. Yeah. Rob. Kiprop, Asbel Kiprop, Kiprop yeah. Asbel Kiprop, who was, you know... He was your iPhone wallpaper for the longest time. He was my time. iPhone wallpaper. I, I think thought very highly of him. <laughs> but uh, if you get caught, I'm sorry, you relinquish your medals. So Nick has had an incredible career. We don't see it because he didn't have the one flashy world record or win the, the one flashy gold medal the way that um, Sensuous did. Not dissing Sensuous. But like you can't, someone who had okay, one so. apex yeah. moment. <laughs> I texted Centro and I let him know you're in our house. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Himself. Someone who has one apex moment is in a, is I don't think um, ought to be in the same conversation as someone who has um, who has that kind of extraordinary long lived. Same thing with Shelly Ann Fraser Price is the greatest female sprinter of all time. Done. 
And you know who's really close to her? Merlin Adi. Mm-hmm. The same, for the same reason. These people have been doing it year in, year out forever. That really, in other sports, they accept this fact. If, you're, if you have one great season in the NBA, you're not, you don't make the Hall of Fame and people don't fall down in love with you. You got to do it. It's LeBron James and Kareem and, or in baseball, it's Hank Aaron who does it for 20 consecutive years. They're the heroes. We have to adopt that same mentality if we're going to promote our sport properly. So before I r- respond to that, and just this is not Tracksmith sponsored in any way, your Nick Willis points, right? Like yeah. you, this is what you believe. They oh, didn't tell you. I've this. always <laughs> believed this long before I was, okay, okay. you know, in bed with Tracksmith. <laughs> <laughs> I think the problem in our sport and the reason why the longevity doesn't get as much play is because we measure it maybe once a year, three times out of every four years, you know, it's a, yeah. if it's not a world championships or if it's not the Olympics, then it doesn't mean anything. Whereas, you know, basketball players have 82 games a season to prove their longevity and, yeah. you know, those statistics to back it up. And so if you don't have gold, 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 then we don't look in between at the, the 329s and the 349s and that consistency and those diamond leagues enough mm. it's just the barometer by which we're measuring greatness is skewed so heavily in one particular performance each yeah. year and that's something yeah y- you're right we're way too olympic focused and and that that's harming our appreciation of what's great in the sport i think did nick respond to that newsletter and say just like he hey sent thanks. more tracks with stuff <laughs> <laughs> no, no, i did not i didn't i didn't even hear from nick i don't even know if he saw it i the uh, you know um but it, <clears throat> I feel the same way, excuse me, by the way. I, I started thinking about this because I did that um, audio book with Paul Simon, mm-hmm. Miracle and Wonder, and I became convinced that Paul Simon was underrated as a musician because he's the, Paul Simon, if you forgive this analogy, he's the Nick Willis of popular music. He's right? going to love that. <laughs> he's, 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 he's the guy who broke, breaks four minutes every year for 20 years. He's musically relevant in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and aughts. Beyonce, mm-hmm. too. Yeah. <laughs> name, you cannot name another popular musician who is musically relevant in that many decades. It, it's impossible. No one else is. Everyone else is. Everyone else, he has, it, like, challengers come up against him in each one of those decades, and then they fade away, and they spend the rest of their career, you know, performing the music that they, that they created over a three-year span. Simon can legit do a conference, a, 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 um, a concert, where he plays music from five different decades and you're into all of that music. Right? That's, That's a mental thing and, you know, the ability to bounce back after a hit. Like when you win the race that no one was expecting you, it is tough to, to follow it up. Yeah. And I think certain people are, you know, programmed in such a way that maybe their highs and lows aren't quite as high. And this is just emotionally speaking. And, you know, that manifests itself physically. And, you know, there's probably something about Nick. And if you've ever had a conversation with him, you see how even keeled he is. And yeah. his highs and lows, he he can take a punch. And, he, you know, he doesn't celebrate too hard ever. And yeah. I, that's probably, you know, that emotional IQ is probably yeah. why. Yeah. I was reading his tweet last night after... Jake Whiteman wins the 1500 meters. It was such classic. I've never met Nick Mills, let's be clear, but oh, really? I, yeah, I am. But he was just, it was such a classic Nick Willis take because it was like basically he was celebrating Jake Whiteman for running a Nick Willis kind of race, right? He ran the smartest, calmest. He stuck on the, you know, was on the rail for as long as possible, made one definitive move, sneaks by. I mean, it was like, it was, but it was, that's, you know, that's one, it was one kind of runner recognizing another in, uh, in that moment. Yeah, he does a great job of that. I mean, Nick was, I think, trying to do some more YouTube, and I was like, you need to do more of this. And Just like the race breakdowns. The race breakdowns, he's brilliant for that's that kind of thing. That's something the sport is missing, and it's something that we would, I know. Mac and I last night sat here immediately after the races, and we watched the race, and we just broke it down. We're, but we don't have rights, obviously, to be able to show the race and draw the X's and O's on the screen. But that's something that every other sport has. And I know mm-hmm. that we're, and I actually spoke to Ashton Eaton yesterday and with Intel, he was working on like the, the heat map of the different speeds that athletes are running and they're showing it on TV and you're seeing this stuff, but now it's like, we need analysis of those data points and mm-hmm. we're showing like the different miles per hour and you know, it's, but like now we got to kick it to the analysts to 
to show why it's impressive. I always think the shot put, it's like, why are we not drawing the angles on screen, like with a yeah. marker and like, let me know how high that got. Was that too high? I, I think the, the shot put they say is like never, apparently it's like impossible to throw 24 meters, but just the, the, the angles that are necessary in the velocity, it would never happen. The height by which you'd have to throw. And so and that's also a huge difference between the athletes, the way Kovacs throws versus the way Krauser throws, just terms of the speed and the launch angle are completely different. And as we've said, it's a simple sport, but that doesn't mean there's not also complicated things going on. And we spend so much time breaking mm -hmm. down the simple side of things when really, I think we should let it be simple, at, you know, on screen and let it speak for itself. And then afterwards, so people can appreciate it, show why what happened, happened yeah well i mean it's hard in that tv window but then at the same time it's like we're we shouldn't be preceded by seven hours of law and order svu on uh, when we're on cnbc or, or usa i think one you can dedicate an hour or two for a pre or post game show we're trying to you know fill that void a little bit but again we don't have the rights to do that kind of stuff and so the, yeah. the marathon is the obvious place to do it because you have so much time and it would be really interesting to have i'm not the first person to think about this you know if all of the Marathon marathoners were or at least the were tricked at were were equipped with the, sen the full range of sensors, and we were seeing in real time what their sort of physiological breakdown was. That would add so much to our understanding of the drama of like there's a moment in the men's marathon here where Cam Levin's fellow oh, Canadian um, former guest on former guest on podcast. Yeah, where Cam you know there's a I've forgotten how many miles are left where there's that lead group of four. It was 10K to go, I think. 10K yeah. to go. And you could just see that, like, I was, trying to, I, was trying to, I was trying to answer the question, is he hanging on or is he in it? And the answer is he was in it. He wasn't hanging on. But how great would it have been to see all of the physiological breakdown to let us know, okay, so who's suffering at this moment? Who's overcoming their suffering? And, like, how, I mean, it just, it just would have, it would have added immeasurably to the storytelling Mm -hmm. of that event it's got to be a percentage of what your max heart rate is i think yes. like that's the way to do it because yeah. obviously yeah, oh he's running at 170 and he's running at 180 well what does that mean so yeah. the idea that it's almost like an hp bar it's like they are running at 99 percent, <laughs> and like they've been in that zone for two minutes it's impossible to be in that zone for yeah. three minutes like yeah because i mean like it, right heart rate is not totally indicative of it because molly seidel posted her strava di uh, data from uh the tokyo olympics and her heart rate was like almost uh, i think maybe oh, close to 200 i think during the final mile when she knew she was gonna get a medal and i was like geez like if we would have had that data it would have been insane to follow or even the moment that uh the woman ahead of her drops out and you realize that like does that cause a spike or anything like that yeah so, or yeah. yesterday in the 400 meter hurdles yeah when karsten how do you pronounce this last Warhol. Warhol. Yeah. Warhol. when he just suddenly hits a wall man we could have can you imagine if we'd seen the data on that because it's it was like it was one hurdle, and all of a sudden, he was just like he was done. And then you got Trevor Bassett just going yeah, at yeah, that's right. <laughs> two hundred the entire time. Yeah. So Malcolm, I mean, uh, what else are you looking forward to while you're out here in Eugene on, on the track? You get to see two days uh, of competition. I'm see two days. I'm gonna see the two. I'm gonna see the two hundred meter final. Okay. Oof. That's gonna be at the 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 build up for that has been. Um, Would you epic. say <laughs> no, uh, men's or women's? Both, uh, I guess. Both, but yeah. the men's is the one that. Although the women's, I mean, I mean, I'm even more as much interested in the women's as I am. I was going to say the men's is a litmus test as well. The the Aryan versus Noah, like who, you know, what like, camp yeah. are you in? Uh, but so first on the women's side, have you ever seen Shellyann run in person? No. So that's, that's going to be. Special. So this is this is my you know because I have my as we talked earlier I have my multiple. Um, ethnic I and and uh, national identities, so I get to be a Canadian, an Englishman, or a Jamaican, depending on the setting. So I'm going to be I'm going to be for the women's 200. I'm I'm basically going to be wearing Jamaican colors and in, in tracksmith. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I get to you know. But when you know when Andre de Grasse won the 200 meters at the Olympics, I was that was I was like, and also when Cam Levins was running, I was like Canadian. I'm like all talk yeah. of Jamaica was was banished in that moment. So yeah, I had to toggle back and forth between various. Do you ever go Team USA? No, I'm not even a citizen, <laughs> so I'm not. No, 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 not doing that. So in the men's race, I mean, are you a bigger fan of 
Aria Knighton or, or Noah Lyles? Lyles is the showman. Knighton's like you the... You might be a Fonbelay guy. Oh, you might be a it's, guy. He's definitely <laughs> Joe Fonbelay guy. It is, I actually hadn't thought about that. I've been thinking a lot about... I just... Something tells me that... Am I wrong? I think this is Lyles all the way. I, I just think that... I might, be, when, I might be biased because I spent three days with Aaron Knighton in Tampa. I don't think it's all the way. I mean, I, I definitely when think it's said, possible. In the post-race, Knighton says, the when they ask him, how hard were you going? And he says 70%. That was the only moment when I was like, wait a minute. Was he really coasting his way to a 19-7? Was it a 19-7? Yeah, yeah. Or was, that, or was he just saying that to get it? No, a lot. Everyone always has a different you know, measurement system in that. It's like, <laughs> what's the pain on 1 to 10? And it's like, I don't know. <laughs> You know, I'm still here, so I guess it's not a ten. So yeah, seventy percent for him might not be our seventy percent. But Lyles, I just feel like Lyles is right now. I mean, he's just, this is about as impressive a sprinter's moment as I've seen since. He's so confident uh, since you Usain Bolt. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm. That's the race where ev- it's a possible U.S. sweep. I think really good chance of, of that. Yeah, because uh, yeah. Kung Fu Kenny looks great too. Yeah. And the men's five k is the other great remaining. Race. I mean, that's going to be epic. When someone's, I think, previously asked you, I don't know if it was when we did a podcast years ago or if you've gone on one of these other shows, that's your favorite event just because what it's like the beating of a drum. Is that how you describe it? Yeah, I just I just think you have time to get into it. You get the 1500 is fantastic, but it's over so quickly that, you know, you don't even have time to get nervous. Whereas in the 5K, I get nervous when I'm watching an Elite 5, 5K. You know, it's like, you know, it just is so tense, and you're just waiting for, and there can be multiple moves, and I don't know. It's, it, it's, there's something that's so dramatic about, um, you know, 13 minutes. Awesome. Well, Malcolm, we appreciate you taking the time for this. People can listen to Legacy of Speed on all the podcast players. I was just asking him before we started recording. I was like, uh, I know he's a big NBA podcast guy, but where does the Sidious Mag podcast fit into mm. his rotation? And he said there's a window right now for uh, no This is no the NBA. track window. This is the track there window. Uh, Malcolm, thank you so much for, for, for kicking back with us. I'm sure we could have probably spent so many more hours just 